Hello, hello. Okay, great. Good evening, everybody. I would like to call this meeting to order. Will you all please rise and join in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Reed? Here. Vice Mayor Litt? Here. Council Member Woods? Here, ma'am. Council Member Marciano? Here, ma'am. Council Member Tinsley? Here. All right. Are there any additions, deletions, or modifications to the agenda this evening? No, ma'am. Thank you so much. And uh, glad everyone made it. We all seem to have barely made it with a bit of traffic this evening. So next we have announcements and presentations. We're first going to call Charlotte Prasinski, our Leisure Services Administrator, to the podium to present the Honda Classic. Good evening, Council. Um, just going to minimize this PowerPoint and open another one. So as you know, I'll get it. It's been a day. Okay, as you know, after the holidays, uh, our city turns into the place to be. Uh, we have first Artie Gras in February, which is the weekend of the 18th, and then the Honda Classic. Um, been in our city for many, many years, and it is one of the longest running international golf tournaments on the tour. So we're still so proud to be hosting them. In 2023 will prove, I'm sure, to be as exciting as any other year that we've had. But as you know, it's more than just a golf tournament. It has an impact on our community, South Florida, and Florida in general through the donations given through the Honda Classics charity. And that impact and that philanthropic giving is the driving force to what the staff that I'm going to introduce here shortly does annually. It is the single driving force to the presentation of this tournament. Tonight, their impact is going to be shared with you by the tournament staff, but also on your consent agenda is Reso 74, and that is your regular approval of the public safety grant that we provide to the Honda to support this event to keep our public safe. And also in there is the partnership agreement that leverages the international focus of the tournament to promote our city as the host city. So without further ado, I'd like to call up Andrew George and congratulate him. He is now the executive director of the Honda Classic Tournament. All you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Good to be here. I, uh, I was worried I was going to get a ticket from the city before we presented to the city. So glad to be here on time. And, uh, Mayor and, and City Council, Ron, great to, great to be with you guys tonight, and I can't believe it's already uh, Honda Classic time again. Um, it's that time of year for us as we get, get rolling, and you know, before we talk about the impact of the Honda Classic on the community, I want to say thank you to, to every one of you for the support you give us, um, you know, from, from the city staff, Ron, all the way down. The, the planning meetings start in Charlotte back in the summer. Um, the business sector turns out. The fans turn out. Um, it really is an economic economic impact um, in a moment for us. It's really been proud over the last you know four or five years, especially to see that ramp up, and it's because of what you guys do. So we were just at the PJ Tour meetings out in Scottsdale last week, um, talking to other tournament directors, talking about the future of the tour. Clearly, the secret sauce that we have is the all-in community that we have right here in Palm Beach Garden. So, again, uh, excited to showcase across a, as Charlotte mentioned, a number of different areas of focus for us. Right, it's economic impact into the community. It's telling that story of the Honda Classic, our philanthropy, our community, the beautiful um, you know, palm trees in late February to the rest of the world, and then the ultimate impact back into the community through, um, through our give back and charity. Uh, so I just want to highlight a few of those. As, as has been often shared, we are the kickoff to the Florida Swing. This is an important time on the schedule. Um, it's, it's really when, when fans and the players themselves start thinking about that major season in the, in the world of golf on the PJ Tour. Uh, it helps us to, to turn out 200,000 plus in attendance. This was the sixth time in seven years that we had over 200,000 people. Uh, of course, the one year we didn't was, was during COVID when we were restricted uh, to 10,000 fans per day in 2021. And that translates into to a lot in, in dollars back into Palm Beach Gardens and Palm Beach County. We had 66 million plus in economic impact. That was a record for us this last year. It was also a record in the total number of room nights 
uh, that we had across the entire uh, county all the way down the, the corridor. Um, and then again, for us, we want to be more than, than just a one-week circus that comes into town you know, with the PJ Tour in late February and then leaves. We want this to be a year-round community focus for us. We live here. We play here. Uh, we're bringing in 350 um, participants through the Junior Honda Classic from all over the world, the best in the world, and their parents, and seeing and experiencing Palm Beach Gardens. We've got 1,000-plus runners that are 5K in January that's coming up. Um, you know, the Honda Classic Cares Week we have. And then, of course, the, the build is more than just February as well. As, as we empathize with the, the residents in Palm Beach Gardens, it starts in early uh, November and goes all the way to the end of March. And so that brings in um, hundreds and hundreds of room nights from the different vendors across our, our landscape. And talking to the build, uh, 350,000 square feet. This was a record. It's going to be bigger in 2023. That double-decker we had at the Bear Trap is going to triple in size. Um, our overall footprint is, is about five times what it was when we took over in 2007. Um, and, a, and a moment that you know, we've focused on since 2007, the, the 24 different public activations, we want to be something for everyone. You walk out, whether you're a golf fan, whether you're part of the corporate sector, um, certainly if you, you enjoy the social scene, and then if you're a true golf fan, we want you to walk away from the Honda Classic feeling like you had a great day. And so the average on the PJ Tour is four public structures. For us, it's been you know, a growing number, and we're up to, to two dozen. And, of course, I mentioned the, the vendor groups that start in early February or early uh, November, excuse me, go through February. We do work really hard on making sure a big lot of those are local, Palm Beach Gardens, Palm Beach County residents, the, the groups that we work with down the stretch to put on the golf tournament. I mentioned the broadcast and telling that story to the rest of the world. Uh, over a billion households now have the reach of the television or digital broadcast. That's 227 different countries and territories. 23 different languages. Um, on the Golf Channel, every single year, the number of hours grows. We're up to 75 hours of live or taped and rebroadcast on Golf Channel and NBC. But then I think because of the growth of the platforms, because of ESPN Plus, because of all the digital that you can watch on your tablet, your computer, your phone, uh, we have 1,200 hours of live coverage around the world on all those different platforms combined. Of course, telling the tourism story that is you know, the great uh, county of Palm Beach County, the great look and feel of Palm Beach Gardens and PJ National Resort. We had over an hour of direct on-air coverage highlighting our great city this last year. And then a couple of highlights from 22 specifically. We are on site trying to build the next generation of, of golf fans and community partners and philanthropists. Um, the, the viewership, we love to see that number continue to uptick from the 18 to 34 adult category, 25% increase from 20, 2021 to 2022. Our final round, which was amazing up until the last 30 minutes of, uh, of that monsoon, 27% uh, year-over-year increase in the viewership there. And then I think this is of note, you know, take out the NFL and the Olympics this last year, the NBC's best sports program through the first two and a half months. That's not just golf, that's all sports. Uh, it was the best viewership they had for the first two and a half months on, on air. And then ultimately, you know, why we get up every morning, you know, why we collaborate with you all um, on a year-round basis is, is, you know, persevering through all the challenges, all those late nights to, to churn out a number for charity back into the community. And this year was another record, $6.45 million. Over 100 different local organizations received funding, and of course, that starts with the lead gift to Jack and Barbara and what they're doing through Nicholas Children's Healthcare Foundation of $2 million for the first time. Um, we've, we've stopped focusing just on the number and dollars and really about the impact. We talk about it, you know, an in, in impact of, of different organizations, but that equates to 100,000 kids and families being impacted, positively impacted from this last year's tournament. As you look more broadly, since inception, for the Honda Classic, $61.7 million donated over the 40 plus years, 300 different charities. And I mentioned Jack and Barbara and what they're doing. You know, the outpatient center right over the Legacy Place, what they have through the Nicholas Children's Hospital down in Miami. They're now touching all 50 states and 119 different countries around the world with patients coming into South Florida. So if you're buying a ticket, you're buying a, a drink or a hot dog out of the tournament, know that you truly are touching someone from around the world uh, through philanthropy on the give back. And this, I, I just want to highlight the, the chart uh, to showcase the momentum. You know, we, we've talked about in different spheres, how do we continue to grow and not plateau? I think you see the last six years, 
of philanthropy has done more than the previous 35 years combined from the Honda Classic, and again, over 61.7 million in total. So again, Charlotte mentioned it, it's going to be the biggest, the, the best Honda Classic uh, that we've had to date. It will be, as we now know, the last Honda Classic uh, under that current mark, moniker. But you know, we look at um, you know, this tournament over the 42 year history had bounced around all of South Florida until it, it rightfully found a home here in Palm Beach Gardens. This is the 21st playing of the Honda Classic in, in Palm Beach Gardens. And so regardless of who the next name is on the front of that logo, uh, it'll be odd for a little bit, but, but we'll get through it. I think we're, we're looking forward to another 21, 22, 25 years of growth under that, uh, that same kind of game plan and, and strategy we've had to get back here in the collaboration with you guys. So uh, before I end, I, I, we do this every couple of years. Um, it's kind of fun to look back to when we started in 2007 and see the growth. This is, this is better than seeing it on paper with the numbers just the visuals. This was the, uh, the 18th hole at the 2007 Honda Classic, the first one at PGA National. And this was this last year, kind of leading into the tournament. You can see the growth on, on the 18th hole. This was, uh, this was Saturday, so we didn't have the rainstorm yet. 17th green, 2007 Honda Classic. And here's the amphitheater of 17 this last year. There's the overview. And then our pride and joy, um, <laughs> the bear trap. I think we were still having the same conversation about capacity and worry of having too many people overserved in 2007. Um, but our total footprint there, I, I think, was no more than our expo tents up at the front now. And you look at the, the bear trap this last year and the double decker. And I mentioned the double decker is going to go all the way down to the water on one side, it's going to go all the way to the Patriots outpost on the other. Um, and you'll see our kind of march as we continue towards the green. But really just proud of, we, we, we could not do this without our volunteers. We could not do it without the sponsors, but we truly couldn't do it without the year-round collaboration with, with you all. And, and that's something that we've been proud of. And, and again, I wouldn't want to have the Honda Classic in any other city than, than Palm Beach Garden. So thank you guys. I'll pause for comments or questions, and then we got one more surprise for you. Go ahead. Let's try it out. My friends want a no-shirt zone in the uh, bear trap. Go back. Let's see. Where do we want to put that? <laughs> <laughs> the other side of the tree over there in the corner. They're all college kids, you know. We'll take, we'll take all kinds. We need the energy. Well, I don't know. I mean, fantastic, Andrew. It's so exciting to have it here, and I know that you get such good hands and uh, a little bit of change in leadership from you guys over the past year, but you do such a great job, and we're just so proud just to watch. I know our staff get all riled up and excited to help and do what they can to make sure that things go smooth. I think we all look forward to it. Uh, I look forward to it. It's my last one as a council member, so that'll be okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, thank you for what you do, and thanks for uh, all the uh, impacts to the city as well. There's, there's no doubt that the Honda has contributed and is responsible for the growth of Palm Beach Gardens as a sports destination that it's become, and the, the living destination now that we're on TV and everyone gets to see the lifestyle that we have here. So besides all of the other wonderful things that you do, you've really helped the city in, in terms of, of establishing us for, for sports, and we're so excited to be a part of what you do. And likewise, you for us too, so thank you. Uh, I agree with all of my colleagues here on the council and you know we always talk about how the, our city continues to grow in every aspect and this is one of those special aspects that has grown with us. And uh, the, what you do for uh, philanthropy of course and for children and, and uh, all of the volunteers and everything it is just a, a complete success and we thank you so much for making this the, our city your home so thank you yep people come for the honda and then they stay and we see it again and again so thank you and um the philanthropy is extraordinary i don't think any of us in this room don't know a uh, someone who's received a grant from you guys from this event and uh, that kind of community collaboration is unparalleled we don't see it almost anywhere else so thank you we'd love to get a picture with you yeah of course and and yeah. right a good segue into we love to give away big checks and normally we do that during honda classic here this week in june 
Um, but the great work that you guys do through Riverside and the Enrichment Center, um, we've we partnered with you for many years to keep that van going and picking up the kids. And so we're at the end of the year, and I'd like to, to call up for the photo Stacy Hunter and Dana Johnson from our staff. If Dana made it through the traffic, uh, <laughs> just Stacy Hunter. Um, just as Ken always said and gave us kudos as staff, I have to do the same because it's not me; it's these guys and what they do on a year-round basis. So. Um, Stacy, coming up, we've got. We want to present you guys with a check and take a photo for seventy-five hundred dollars to keep the Riverside van going around the city. Uh, it is a cold apartment. Okay, so thank you guys. Next up, we have our Assistant Chief of Operations, Corey Vassett. If you could come to the podium and introduce the next three presentations. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, Mr. Ferris. Thank you for having us here tonight. And yes, uh, this is a good night. I like coming up here and, and recognizing uh, the good that our department does. And tonight we have three awards that will be, be uh, presented to us and uh, you know that puts us second to none and keeps us out front uh, we don't accept mediocrity only excellence so uh, we work hard and strive hard for that the first one up is going to be the American Heart Association Mission Lifeline Gold Plus recognition and for that I'd like to invite uh, Kayla Fox and our medical director Dr. Shepke up here for the presentation. Now, this is not only hard work from our people in the field, our paramedics, but it's also uh, with collaboration uh, with our local hospitals to make sure that our patients get the highest level of care uh, and have the best outcomes from heart attacks within the city. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kayla Fox. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. It's a pleasure to be here this evening um, to recognize your EMS for the Gold Plus 2022 Mission Lifeline Award. Mission Lifeline EMS recognition is a program designed to showcase pre-hospital agencies nationwide for excellence in heart attack and stroke care. Pre-hospital personnel are the first care providers to patients suffering from acute emergencies. So your role in the care for these patients is crucial and often sets the course for the patient's outcomes. The award is presented to EMS teams that meet the highest standard of response care for people experiencing a heart attack and follow the latest American Heart Association guidelines to make sure patients are receiving the best standard of care. It's my privilege to present this award to the Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue for the eighth year and an honor to have a Mission Lifeline recipient in our community. I'd like to present this certificate to Corey Bissett and Dr. Kenneth Shepke, Medical Director. Congratulations. So I just want to say a quick word, if you'll indulge me. 
Cardiovascular disease remains the number one killer of Americans. And this award is a great award. It really shows the collaboration between the department, certainly this body, our town manager, and certainly the, the culture of excellence established under, under our, our fire chief. This is not one year, not two years, not three years. I mean, this is eight years in a row. This is not a one-off. This is absolutely a culture of excellence in treating the residents of, of, this, of this city in the number one killer of Americans. And our goal was to make Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue the premier EMS agency in the country. And this is certainly evidence that we are, we are certainly at that goal. Thank you very much. We'll stay put. Keep on going, Corey. Yeah, you have yours. Uh, next up, I'm going to keep Dr. Shepke up here. He's going to change his hats because now he also serves as a deputy secretary for health for the state of Florida. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to him to present to us the uh, Emergency Medical Services Educator of the Year Award. Okay, different hat. <laughs> so every year, the Florida Department of Health recognizes EMS agencies and EMS providers for excellence in various areas. This year, uh, one of the categories is the EMS Educator of the Year, which recognizes leadership in education and making a huge impact in the community, both at the local, state, and national level. So just talk a little bit about Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue and some of the achievements that they've made, uh, and you all collectively have made. It begins with excellence in the Recruit Academy, with a six-week training course in high-fidelity mannequins and even virtual reality training for the students that are coming, for the paramedics that are coming on, on board as, uh, to, serve the, to serve the health needs of, of this community. That's not something that's standard in all EMS or fire rescue agencies, to have that outstanding support and education so they become expert at our uh, scientifically advanced protocols and manage to gain the skills and those life-saving skills that you need to win that other award that we just talked about. Certainly at the high-tech sim lab, which takes a lot of support from you all to maintain that. The sim lab, I don't know if you've ever seen it, these, it is amazing technology to give paramedics that are training and firefighters that are training, real life scenarios from mannequins that literally breathe, they blink, their vital signs change as, as you manage, manage their, their disease or, or their trauma process. That really gives them that real life feel that, that mimics what, they'll, what the, the paramedics will see in real life. They have a resuscitation academy. Again, cardiovascular disease and, and heart attacks, number one cause of death. And maintaining those skills, absolutely critical. And they do that on a routine basis, and that's shown in our return of spontaneous circulation numbers. They have outside experts that come in, so they don't just use our own internal experts. We'll bring in stroke experts, EKG experts, pediatric experts, so they always have the most latest cutting-edge scientific advancements and that training at their fingertips. And it's a data-driven education, which is very, very important. We don't just pick topics. We look at the outcomes with our partners with the hospitals, Chief Bissett met, meets with all the hospital leadership in, in, the, in our area, in our transport zone, and we look at what are the outcomes that our patients are seeing? Are there any areas for improvement? Things that we can make even better than the outcomes that we're getting right now, and we take that back to the training piece and, and, and improve the skills in our, in, in, I keep saying our, but I'm trying to be my, the state, in the, in the uh, paramedics that treat our, our, our community. But it's not just what we do internally here, what Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue does internally. There's a community component to this. And that's part of the award as well, is what impact you make in the community. And there's a partnership that Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue has for years with the Palm Beach Gardens Medical Center, uh, Palm Beach Gardens High School's Medical Magnet Program, and with the Palm Beach State College EMS Training Academy, training our ne next generation of paramedics, EMTs, and healthcare providers. And that couldn't be done without partnerships with an excellent organization like Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue. But the CPR training and the stroke training that our community gets is also critically important giving the folks that live in this town the skills they need to be first responders for their loved ones when they have either one of these, these diseases, which are all too common. And it gives the residents the highest chances of having good outcomes, combined with the excellent efforts that will occur once 911 is called and, and our folks arrive. And last but not least, they share their expertise by publishing in nationally recognized EMS journals like EMS World and the Journal of EMS. So, on behalf of the Florida Department of Health, it is my honor to announce this year's State EMS Educator of the Year Award, Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue. And, uh,
to accept will be Division Chief Leza, who is our Training Chief. Last but not least, um, the last award that we'll be uh, recognized for, I'll again invite Chief Leza up here to accept, and uh, Vance Kibler from FirstNet AT&T. Uh, what this award is about uh, is very important to us as a department, uh, and that is providing health and wellness to our employees. Uh, you know, we run on emergency calls to our residents and visitors day in and day out. And we do it tirelessly and selflessly. Uh, and mental health and physical health also take a, take a little bit of a beating. We go out and find subject matter experts to make sure that we address the physical and mental wellness of every firefighter and paramedic out there. And it did not go unrecognized. It was a great honor to go to EMS World and accept this award. And I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, Vance Kibler to, to go ahead and make that presentation. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor and Council Members. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here to present to your fine folks the first net built with AT&T Wellness and Resilience Award for the Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue. And what what he was talking about is exactly how we work. We care about the people that are out in the community and what FirstNet does basically makes sure everything in the community works in a crisis. So the people that are out there doing the hard work, that's who we need to be concerned with. So FirstNet Health and Wellness Program was established in May of 2020 in an effort of AT&T to coordinate strategically plan and have the organizational support health and wellness for first responders. <coughs> The program was established because AT&T recognizes that first responders face significant health risks as the result of the work they do for our communities. First responders face, experience poor traumatic stress, acute stress, anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation at rates greater than the general public. This award is an example of FirstNet's commitment to the public safety, their wellness, and who they are because we know you matter. We can build the most beautiful network in the world, but if we don't have first responders, it means <coughs> absolutely nothing. So thank you for being here. We would not be as effective. And thank you for being here today. Congratulations again to the Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue, the first ever recipient of the 2022 EMS, first net built with AT&T Wellness and Resilience Award. The proactive resilience and wellness programs <coughs> you have implemented Addressing multiple aspects of responder health, wellness, makes you different in your lives, your patients' lives, and your community. Thank you. Uh, if you'd like to come down, we can break up pictures in each one. That'd be great.
Thank you all for your patience. We wanted to make sure we really took a moment because that is extraordinary. And uh, the words culture of excellence are, are ringing in my head now because I, I think that you can really see that from all of our first responders and our staff, so thank you. Moving along to resolution 81, which is in remembrance of Donald Leo Kosluski Sr. Let's see, where's, where's Don K? Hello, all right. What we'd like to do tonight is um, take a moment. We were honored to be invited to your father's remembrance ceremony. And in his honor, we had, we had our beautiful staff make a, another beautiful brick for your dad and for his dedicated service as mayor, vice mayor, and council member, and a, a builder of our city. So if you indulge me again, we're going to take a moment to read Resolution 81. This resolution serves to honor and celebrate the life of Donald Leo Kosluski Sr., former Palm Beach Gardens mayor, vice mayor, and councilman. Emphasized in Resolution 81 of 2022 are Kosluski's remarkable achievements as a public servant, traveler, historian, and outstanding member of our community. This is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, honoring and celebrating the life of Donald Leo Kosluski Sr., providing an effective date and for other purposes. Whereas, the City of Palm Beach Gardens lost an esteemed public servant and friend with the passing of Don K. Sr. on November 1st, 2022. And whereas Don demonstrated extraordinary devotion to the City of Palm Beach Gardens, serving four three-year terms and holding the titles of mayor, vice mayor, and councilman. And whereas beyond the above-mentioned achievements, Don held several other impressive titles throughout his life, including Eagle Scout, U.S. Army Captain, Patent Holding Engineer, Business Owner, Published Author, and Beloved Husband, Father, and Grandfather. And whereas Don, as an avid traveler, visited all 50 states, and 122 countries, documenting his experiences in over 500 published articles, and taking inspiration from his love of travel to open PBG Travel, a family-run agency. And whereas Don developed a strong passion for history and education, he shared his vast knowledge with the community through his writing and his involvement in local PTAs. And whereas Don co-founded the Palm Beach Gardens Historical Society and co-authored Palm Beach Gardens, Images of America, a photographic history of the city he so cherished. And whereas Don is survived by his high school sweetheart and wife, Arlene, and their loving children and grandchildren. Whereas the city council deems approval of this resolution to be in the best interest of the health, safety, and welfare of the residents and citizens of the city of Palm Beach Gardens and the public at large. Now, Therefore, it be resolved by this city council of the city of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, that, section one, the foregoing recitals are hereby affirmed and ratified, section two, the city council on behalf of the city of Palm Beach Gardens is proud to honor the life of Donald Leo Kosluski Sr. and celebrate his outstanding achievements. Section three, this resolution shall become effective immediately upon adoption. It was such an honor for you to invite our council to your father's services. It's an honor to sit in his seat and to maintain the dream that he saw for a community that we all love. So we all um, give you our condolences and hope that uh, all of your memories serve you every day. And we're even more proud that you're here today for one of your projects as you continue your family to, to be a big part of our city. So thank you for allowing us this honor. just end now that was just <laughs> aside from the building that's coming up of course let's see all right next we have comments from the public I do have one comment card for an item not on the agenda from Ms. Suzanne Archer Ms. Archer if you would mind please coming to the podium state your name and address and if you've been sworn in good evening uh, my name is Suzanne Archer 
I live at 3187 Gardens East Drive here in Palm Beach Gardens. I am very proud to live in Palm Beach Gardens and in Florida after all of this that we hear here. Um, my question to the council is that I would like to uh, request a written explanation on how my home, which is homesteaded, and I own it fee simple, it's not a condo, had a permit pulled for a re-roof when I never signed a contract with a contractor and I have no notice of commencement. Uh, on December 6th of this month, I noticed a permit was pulled on my roof, so I would like an explanation of how the city finds it to be legal since I never filed it, signed any documents, and is this some type of title fraud or what's going on? All right. Well, we're glad you're here tonight. We'll uh, we'll look into it. We've got your information. So well, I was here the last time, and I was told to get in touch with the building department. I submitted documents. I got them back quickly with nothing, not a comment, nothing in writing. So if I can have something in writing as to how this happened, I see a notice commencement was filed with the count in the clerk of courts, but it's on land, not on buildings. So even your notice of commencements that you take from, I guess, the builder or contractor are incomplete. And the governor's office is investigating this as well. I just got a letter from them today. So how this happens, when I called the city building department and mentioned the notice of commencement was on land and not on homes, which protects me from being leaned twice, I was told, well, it was filed with the county. And I said, well, have you read the numbers and the letters that are on this piece of paper? Because it means nothing. It means that my home isn't protected and I didn't sign the notice of commencement. And it supposedly has to be signed by the owner. Uh, well, so, our, our city manager. It's an operational issue. We'll get with the building department, communicate with her again. Yeah, with in writing, please, detailed, so I can uh, explain that to other officials that I'm in contact with. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Archer. All right, so we're going to um, move on to the city manager report. Thank you, Mayor, council members. Just a couple items for you uh, this evening. <clears throat> the first one would be, and as you know, at the last council meeting, count, uh, the council authorized the city to enter into a sister city uh, agreement with Wachula. Uh, uh, I want to update you on the activities that have occurred since then. First, a video. Just wanted to let you know that um, our staff visited on November 16th, uh, Christ Fellowship Church and the city staff delivered 91, 91 care packages and provided meals to the Wachula staff. Um, and uh, as you saw on the video, David Williams, thank you for taking the video and editing that. Um, we have plans now on tomorrow uh, to be going to Wachula again, uh, sponsoring for the family and the uh, employees lunch and toy deliveries, a late lunch and toy delivery. Uh, we have had cooperation from our police department's annual joy drive. Uh, they partnered with us on uh, Sister City 
and they're going to provide 70 toys uh, for the children of the employees in Wachula uh, for Christmas. Um, I'll continue to bring you updates uh, in the future. And actually, I'd like to thank David Reyes and our entire staff and project team uh, for the tremendous efforts. Uh, we still have uh, the uh, Amazon list out if contributions are still needed. I'd also like to thank the city of Callaway up in the Panhandle for their $15,000 donation as they uh, pay it forward for uh, when we assisted them in their time of need after the hurricane. It's been a, uh, uh, quite a collaborative effort and everyone is enjoying uh, this. And the response from the employees has been amazing and very tearful, I might add. They're very grateful for what the city is doing for them because they thought no one would remember them but we did. So I want to thank you for your support and let you know about our continued efforts to help them out. The other item that I'd like to bring to your attention is uh, sad for us, but happy for someone else, I'm sure. Uh, tonight is uh, the last meeting that Alan Owens, our finance administrator, will attend. Uh, his retirement is January the 6th. I'm sure he's looking forward to it. Most of us are not. Uh, but Alan has been here for 20 and one half years. Alan, I wish to thank you uh, for our 32 years of serving together. Uh, you're amazing. Uh, I just can't think of all the words uh, to describe some of them. Couldn't say anyway, but you know that. Uh, <laughs> but Al and I have been through thick and thin for 32 years, um, 20 and a half here, and uh, you're going to be sorely missed. But time marches on, change continues, and uh, I'm sure that we will be able to continue because Al has taught his staff how to make things work Alan Owen's way. So. With that, Alan, I salute you, and I hope you keep in touch, buddy. We will. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That concludes my report. Okay, now we should end the meeting, because this is... <laughs> All right. So next we have the consent agenda. Will there be anything pulled from the consent agenda this evening? No. no. All right. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All right. So hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Moving on. We're moving on now to our public hearings. This is a quasi-judicial hearing, so I'm going to read the quasi-judicial statement. Tonight we are holding quasi-judicial hearings on the following case. Resolution 76, 2022, Florida Power and Light and Company Phase 2 Site Plan. This means that the City Council is required by law to base its decision on the evidence contained in the record of this proceeding, which consists of the testimony at the hearing, the materials which are in the official city file on this application and any documents presented during this hearing. The council is also required by law to allow cross-examination of any witnesses who testify tonight. Cross-examination may occur after the staff, the applicant, and other participants have made their presentations and will be permitted in the order of the witness's appearance. It is necessary that anyone who testifies at the hearing remain until the conclusion of the hearing in order to be able to respond to any questions. If you plan to testify this evening or wish to offer written comments, please fill out a card over here to my right and give it to our city clerk. The city clerk will now swear in all persons who intend to offer testimony this evening on any of these cases. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? That's right. Thank you, Patty. If you could please read the title. 
Resolution 76, 2022, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving a site plan within the PGA Office Center Plan Community Development, PCD, to allow the development of a six-story, 249,130-square-foot office building, Phase 2, and a three-story parking garage, which is approximately 15 acres, more or less in size, and is located east of Military Trail, west of RCA Center Drive, north of PGA Boulevard, and south of Kyoto Gardens Drive, as more particularly described to you in providing conditions of approval, providing one waiver, providing effective date for other purposes. Okay, thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to open the hearing. We're going to start by declaring ex parte. Marcy? Yes, um, I spoke to Don Kislewski and Ken Tuma. Today. Wonder Today, okay. Yesterday. All right, and then we'll go over to Rochelle. None. Oh, mic microphone. And we have Mark. I spoke with Don K yesterday. Yesterday? Okay. Yesterday. And Carl. Negative. All right, and for myself, Don Kay called me yesterday to see if I had any questions, and I had none. So if we have the petitioner, Ken Tuma, come on up, please. Hi, good evening. Ken Tuma with Urban Design Studio. My address is 610 Clematis Street, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33401. I've been sworn in today. Madam Mayor, thank you for having us here this evening. Here today on behalf of Florida Power and Light, what is in front of you this evening is a second building of the PJ Office Center uh, uh, PCD. The building that you're gonna see this evening is very similar in size and scale and also an architectural design to what you previously approved three years ago, which is well under construction today. In fact, I just checked with the FPL team and they still plan on moving people in towards the end of this year. So hopefully building number one will be occupied and, with, and you'll I'll get the opportunity to see how building number two will tie into that. We have our whole team assembled this evening, including our transportation engineer, Mr. Hagen is here. Representatives of Perkins and Will are here, both architects, and it's a beautiful building. We have, of course, Don Kay and John Rosenthal from Florida Power and Light, uh, Marty from our office, and I wanna make sure I miss anybody, and, and Mr. Seymour is our attorney. Thank, so thank you for letting me go through this this evening. It will be short, somewhat short, Mr. Woods. Okay, so the PJ, the subject site is 86.34 acres. This is the PCD that you approved, that this city approved back in 2013. And this is the building, this is an aerial, this picture is a couple days old. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like today, it's pretty exciting when you get the opportunity to see it from the air. A couple things have occurred. The lake on the left-hand side of your screen or the west side has been expanded. Building number one here is completely constructed, and I have pictures of the interior to show you in a few minutes. And then here's the parking garage. The area in discussion this evening will be this area right here where building number two is being proposed. What is in front of you this evening is a site plan request for a six-story building, very similar to the first building that was constructed. It's, uh, it's 249,130 uh, square feet. It's a three-story parking garage. That parking garage holds 701 vehicles. There are two building connectors to building one, and this is a pretty neat part of this building. So basically what's occurring, you can see here, and I'll show you in more detail, there are two connectors between the buildings. Those connectors are walkways, so on the ground floor, it's air-conditioned space to allow for a connection between building one and building two. It's a two-story style uh, construction, so it's a very tall, elevated ceiling. And then on top of that, you, the two buildings connect on the third floor through a rooftop terrace. It's a walkway that connects the two buildings. It's a very unique space, and I'll spend some time going through that when we get to that part of the presentation. Um, there's a 3,000-gallon fixed fuel system and one waiver. That waiver is a request to allow for a taller fence in which your code allows a long uh, PGA Boulevard 995. So history on the project, and this is important. Way back in 2005, this project was approved. That project had some significant off-site improvements that it was part of the improvements in that time. 
first thing in 2005, the traffic for this project was granted by a concurrency statement. That traffic from 2005 is the same capacity that we're using today. So it's important to note that any traffic study since 2005 has had to take that traffic in its background traffic growth. So this has been part of Palm Beach Gardens since 2005. But some of the items that happened in 2005, and I see my, my friend sitting in the audience here, he'll remember this much better than I will. He can, had the, they constructed RCA Center Boulevard, also constructed Kyoto Gardens as part, of the pro, as part of the program elements. That occurred in 2005. In 2011, Florida Power & Light purchased this property. Jumping ahead to 2013, the city approved a, a conversion of the traffic, a conversion of the uses from what was proposed as an industrial and research and manufacturing area to 993,000 square feet of office. As part of that, a master plan was approved, design guidelines were adopted, the PCD buffers and the street skates were approved at that time also. Along the way, it took a while to get to that first building. Florida Power and Light was very thoughtful in their design and when they needed to build the building. But a lot of things occurred along the way. Other traffic improvements, were, which were part of that development order, included the military trail turn lane. It was extended as part of the construction. Uh, they updated the landscaping on alternate A1A. The upland preserve, there's a 10-acre upland preserve on the north side, that was enhanced. The PCD buffers were installed all before the first building was constructed. Um, jumping to 2019, the, the, uh, the building that, that is under construction today, a site plan was approved. That had some other components that were part of that, that were changes in the traffic patterns and design. One of the key items of that was the road, RCA here, was shifted to the west to create more stacking along the uh, adjacent to the FEC. So that has been completed. We drive out there today, that road is in place. Also at that intersection, there is a warrant or there is a signal analysis that Florida Power and Light has to do every year. So those are kind of the history of the development order and what's been implemented since that time. That building is very close to be moved into and I know there's a lot of folks very excited about moving into the new space. So this is the, the, the phase one approval, just for a frame of reference to remind you, there's a parking garage, and then here's the building itself, a six-story building. The building was a bit tall, or excuse me, a bit, uh, had a bit more square footage, about 20 more thousand square feet than what's in front of you this evening. And this is the actual building. And I wanna drop back for a second, because here are the renderings that we showed you a couple years ago. And here's the actual building. It's really coming out very nicely. You can see the deep pockets, the pedestrian areas, the use of glass, the fins, all the design elements. And this is actually a view from that kind of atrium area that separates the two. It's a really neat. I hope one day I get the opportunity to go visit the building <laughs> once it's been constructed. I think it's gonna be really beautiful. And this is another view of the building. Again, occupancy um, anticipated by the end of the year. You can see the, the, the design features the landscaping that's been put in, these are not 12 foot high trees, these are very significant trees that FPL has put in from day one. So a couple of the big picture design overviews for this, similar to the first building, 500 year, uh, 500 year storm, category five building, flexible, allowing for um, a significant amount of storm riders, the, the parking garage, the first floor of the parking garage is taller than normal to allow for the FPL to park trucks there during storm season to allow for immediate, uh, immediate release once a storm is there. So a couple things about the office center, phase one and phase two, just to walk you through the details of it, of the new building that's being proposed. So this is the existing building here, and this is the proposed new building, a six story, very ex exact same height as the other one, a three story parking garage. The main entrance, which is still gonna be located here. We are also adding two access points, one a little further down Kyoto Gardens and one here on RCA Center Boulevard, or RCA Center, and I'll walk you through that in a bit more detail in a second. So here's the new building, 249,130 square feet. 
These are those connectors, which I'll show you a perspective of so you can get a feel of what that looks like. And then this is a loop road. So that's not there today. This road is intended to help disperse traffic to allow employees to enter into the site and to allow for visitors to enter into the site. The fixed fuel system down here, this is a 3,000 gallon fuel system. It's an above ground tank. Um, its purpose and intent, while it may be used daily, but the purpose and intent of it is really for storm to allow for the ability to have additional fuel. It's a 3,000 gallon tank. It will be highly protected. There'll be, uh, it will have security cameras on it, and it's gonna be located hopefully in the southwest corner of this site. Just a little bit of the site data, just to give you the kind of the background on the site. The, the code requires 40% uh, open space, we have 69%. The parking, we meet all the parking requirements that are part of this individual single tenant building. Uh, visitor parking, an important thing that this site, like if you've been to the Juno Beach campus, similar to the Juno Beach campus, all the security, all the entrance points will be through one building. It'll be through building one. So you have to check in. And so there are 50 parking spots here, which have been constructed. Those will be used as the guest parking for it. So if you want to go to the site, you have to be checked in, go through the gate or go through the uh, employee check-in and work your way into the space that you're supposed to go to. This is a cross section of the building. Just to give you a frame of reference, on the right-hand side, this is Kyoto. There is a berm. That berm is a significant height, goes from 9 to 14 feet, depending where you are. There are also a significant amount of trees on top of that landscaping. Those uh, palm trees there are a mix of height from 30 and 40 feet, so there would be some really big trees there. A three-story parking garage, that height of that parking garage is 42 feet. And then here's the building itself. Say just like the other building, the bottom floors, the first two floors are accessory uses, cafes, uh, multi-space gathering areas, conference areas, and then floors four through six, excuse me, floors three through six will be for office space. Um, exact same design. It has that angled roof of Mr. Chu is here. He can articulate why that's so important, but it has to do with their wind loading and how they designed the site to be a Category 5 building. So this is a view looking at it from, from a perspective, from an artistic uh, rendering. Here's building number one. This is building number two. You can kind of see how it's angled. And you start getting a view of those corridor or connection points, which are really important. Then internally to that, it creates this nice secure space for employees to have a nice rest area. Also, you'll see that we've added a new water feature. So as you come into it and the drop-off area, there's a water feature here that wasn't in the original design. That water feature is a significant spot and hopefully will provide nice in the background noise and become a very nice spot for everyone to hang out at. So this is my favorite view, looking at it at night, looking towards the east to get a view of what the lighting will look like and then also what an evening look. This is again, this is the, the uh, entry feature here and you can see how the light uh, reflects off of it. Okay, so this is the, the kind of the, the shot on how the building really works. Here you can, you're looking towards the northwest, building two is on the right-hand side, the existing building's on the left-hand side. This is the corridor or the connections. There's one on the east, one on the west. That large open space, which is basically two floors of open space, this becomes a huge gathering area for employees to mingle and exchange ideas. And then here is the terrace on top, which is also a connection point. So that is on the third floor, it connects the third floor of both buildings. And this is a view of what it's going to look like on the inside. Seems like a great place. Certainly, uh, FPL employees, I think, are going to enjoy that space. And then you get an idea of what the internal courtyard is going to look like looking in here. It's going to be a very enjoyable space for the employees and a secured space. This is another view of the courtyard looking west. You can see how Mr. Chu designed all the large overhangs. You get a feel of the building for the fins, the, con the use of concrete, and, of course, the landscaping. Art in public places, there is an art in public places requirement. We are going to meet that art in public places requirement. 
Uh, initially, for the first building, they, the FPL has escrowed 1% of the construction costs of the first building already, and we expect to come in front of you, your AIPP board, with our in this general location, but of course it hasn't been approved yet. The loop road, this is an important part from a traffic uh, flow standpoint. Uh, your staff worked diligently with us on this and our traffic engineer on how a loop road connection would work. First thing, we've added two additional access points, one here in Kyoto, a right in and right out. There's also a turn lane coming in, the same thing here on RCA, a right in, right out with an additional turn lane. As I mentioned earlier, all the guest parking would be focused here. A change, a small nuance, a small change on this plan, you'll note on the plan set that identifies that we're replacing the mechanical gates or replacing the hand closed gates with mechanical gates or automatic gates. So if sometime in the future, FPL needs to secure the facility, there'll actually be gates that they can push a button to close instead of having to send someone out. It doesn't happen very often, but any corporate campus has, that, has a security matter, that, and particularly a public utility, they wanna have the opportunity to close the facility off if they need to and only be used in an emergency situation. This is the fuel system that I identified a little earlier, the 3,000 uh, gallon fuel tank will be located here uh, in a safe, secure area. And then in regards, this is my final slide. So in regards to a waiver, we are requesting the ability to place a 10 foot high decorative fence on the area identified in blue. Your code allows for eight feet. Our request is for two additional feet to allow for a height of 10 feet. Uh, makes very good sense from a waiver standpoint. This is a public utility. Security is important for this area. And with that, we have our whole team assembled happy to answer any questions you may have thank you thank you so much ken all right do we have a staff presentation hi joanne good evening uh good evening mayor and council joanne screw the planning and zoning department i have been sworn in i have a very brief presentation for you on the fpl phase two project I'm gonna skip over some of the slides that Mr. Tuma already covered. Um, this slide shows the uh, outline of the entire PCD, which is 83 acres in size. Uh, phase one, which is currently under construction and nearing completion, encompassed about 37 acres, and the affected area for this site plan is about 15 acres. I do wanna point out that a significant portion of this PCD is the 10-acre preserve on the north side of Kyoto Gardens Drive, and that is being maintained. Um, to point out a few of the highlights of the project history, it was originally approved in 2005, and uh, that approval was updated in 2013 for an office program. Those are the dates when the traffic for this project was approved. So with regard to traffic mitigation, there were a significant number of improvements that were constructed by the uh, applicant and the original developer to address traffic concurrency and traffic mitigation, including the construction of Kyoto Gardens Drive and the bridge and dedication of that roadway to the city, construction of RCA Center Drive, extension of a turn lane on North Military Trail, improvements on alternate A1A, and an artistic bus shelter that was installed on Kyoto Gardens Drive recently and uh, will be operational soon as a stop for Palm Tran. In addition to the required improvements for traffic concurrency, um, there are additional traffic and mobility safety improvements that the applicant has worked with staff to implement. Um, one of the biggest items was the realignment of RCA Center Drive to move to the west, which provided greater separation from the intersection of Kyoto Gardens Drive and alternate A1A. This allows for the potential for signalization of this intersection. Um, preliminary reviews of the traffic report does show that that signal will be triggered very soon, likely with the first report and certainly with the second report, if not the first. The applicant has uh, posted surety for this improvement. The applicant has also provided a U-turn movement on Kyoto Gardens Drive to provide uh, westbound access to the um, I-95 ramp. The applicant has also widened the sidewalk on the south side of Kyoto Gardens Drive from five feet to a 12-foot wide multi-use path, and there's also a contribution of $20,000 for an artistic bus shelter on North Military Trail. 
Um, so a summary of this request, it's for a six-story office building with associated three-story parking garage, completion of that internal loop road, um, two enclosed connecting corridors, connecting the phase one and phase two buildings with third floor rooftop terrace connections, a central courtyard between those connectors and accessory structures. This slide shows the affected area of this site plan that's before the council tonight, including the two accessory structure areas. The site plan does include two new access points on Kyoto Gardens Drive and RCA Center Drive. These are designed as right-in, right-out driveway points, and they both include turn lanes. The building is located central to the site with the parking garage on the north side. Um, a significant design feature that was uh, designed and implemented with phase one is the sable berm that Mr. Tuma pointed out that is being planted in advance to provide screening of the parking garage and that will have time to mature as the building is being built. This slide shows uh, pedestrian and bicycle access throughout the site. The um, pathways that you see highlighted in blue are implemented with phase one and the uh, areas that are shown in red are proposed with phase two. So there are multiple ways for pedestrians and bicycles to use the sidewalks internal to the site to access the building and the right of ways. The six story portion of the building is set back 300 feet from Kyoto Gardens Drive and the um, 42 foot tall parking garage is set back 107 feet from Kyoto Gardens. The site also includes numerous directional and ground signs to assist the public with wayfinding throughout the site. And there are also ground signs located on Kyoto Gardens Drive and RCA Center Drive to help visitors and the public understand what the access points are for. The applicant is meeting the parking requirements and I do want to point out that the applicant is providing 72 EV charging spaces with the potential for 80 additional future stations for a total of 152. The accessory uses include an above ground fixed fuel tank um, and an associate, uh, a drone in the box. The fuel tank will be uh, located in the southwest corner of the site and will feature additional plantings to assist with screening. It will be secured access for FPL employees to fuel FPL vehicles only. And the drone in the box uh, is an important demonstration tool to assist with um, recovery and surveillance of the FPL facilities. The landscape plan continues the same native theme that was implemented with phase one. The, the applicant submitted a color-coded uh, landscape plan that shows the various um, ecosystems and uh, planting mixes that are provided with a phase two. And I do want to point out that the sable berm was approved with phase one and being planted in advance. The applicant uh, agent has shown these renderings, so I'll just flip through them very quickly. and staff of support of, of the waiver for the 10 foot tall fence along the south and western perimeters. The applicant has noticed the petition and the PZAB recommended approval as well and staff also recommends approval. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have two comment cards. If we could please call Chip Armstrong. Please state your name, your address and whether or not you've been sworn in. Uh, Chip Armstrong. I live at 4240 Delmore Court. That's in Riviera Beach, right down the street. And uh, I did stand and I was sworn in. Um, I'm here to speak on, in support of this project. I want to start by thanking the city and especially uh, City Manager Ferris in supporting the Chamber's effort. I also chair the Economic Development Committee for the Chamber, Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce for uh, in your leadership and collaboration in helping us to develop a, a resilient action plan. This is absolutely fits with that. How fortunate we are to have a, a building like this in our region brought by a great corporate citizen. So um, thank you and I support it. And I think the CEO. Thank, thank you, Mr. Armstrong. We also have uh, Dave Markarian. If you could come to the podium, please state your name, address, Thank and Thank you. I have sworn been in. sworn in. Dave Markarian, 215 Via Condado Way, 
Palm Beach Gardens. I am a business owner in this community. I am a resident of the beautiful community of Mirabella. And I'm here in those capacities as well as in my capacity of board of directors of the Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce. Um, Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce has expressed its support for this project and has provided its formal letter of support for purposes of inclusion in your record and more particularly as a project that's deemed to have strategic regional significance because the chamber reserves its active support for projects that have actual regional strategic significance. Uh, more particularly, both phase one and phase two together are a part of what we've seen to be nationally significant restoration efforts. As we recently saw, the focus of the nation was upon our area because this is ground zero for restoration efforts across the state for uh, hurricane uh, storms that occur and those restoration efforts fostered by the applicants uh, this development. Beyond all that, this company across the board is a good corporate citizen. I don't think there can be any better testament than one of our board members as we were debating this uh, said to me, well, her house is just to the northwest in that community of where phase one is being built. She can step outside with her child, look and see the footprint and has not had a single uh, obstacle and, you know, problem nuisance from the current development. But beyond being good corporate citizens, they bring jobs and they don't just bring jobs, they bring nice people, people that you're proud to have as friends, proud to have as neighbors. And beyond that, a spillover effect for every business, restaurant, or the service industry because they service, uh, they utilize the services of our community. And this is the private citizen part of my presentation or my appearance. <coughs> the most overlooked contribution of this company to our community and beyond is their commitment to a clean emissions profile, which means we have clean fuel generating electricity that helps us be energy independent, harnesses new technologies, and honestly leads, leads the nation and the world in terms of effective, efficient energy generation using the, the best technology. So for all those reasons, I believe this project continues your track record of responsible development in the community. And it's actually beautiful when you drive uh, north to south on I-95 and look at the footprint of the building, which I don't think any of us expected. It's actually enhancing to the skyline. Thanks for everything. Thank you so much, Mr. Markarian. All right, so I'm going to close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? I'll make a motion to approve resolution 76-2022. Second. All right, so Rochelle, you made the motion. Would you like to kick off the discussion? Sure. So to follow up on, on Dave's last comments, um, phase one and phase two are certainly striking additions to the Palm Beach Gardens TOD. Um, just coming over that bridge and, and seeing the buildings is, is establishing what that area, you put them together with the two DeVosta Towers and we see what the future of, of the TOD is going to look like. Um, they are certainly the most resilient and sustainable buildings uh, built thus far in, in the city, and I would argue anywhere in, in the region or the county, uh, which will have a positive impact on the entire region. In, in the case of a 100-year, and God forbid, a 500-year event, which you've planned for, um, it's nice to know that, that you are here close to us and, and doing everything you can uh, to make it easier for us to, to come back from what we need to. Um, we certainly have no complaints about the number of charging stations. If FP&L cannot put in the right number of charging stations um, for electric cars and, and lead the way, I don't know who can. Uh, as far as the bicycle racks, I did bring up at my agenda review, I think it would be interesting because we are in the TOD to do a follow-up at a later date after the employees are in and see exactly where they're coming from and who is 
riding and, and how, what effect on mobility, uh, the ability to, to ride into work on a bike and then go take a shower and, and, and go to work is, is having. There's certainly a number of communities north on Military Trail where employees could take advantage of that. So I'd love to see follow up on that later. And um, it's also my understanding that the traffic light on RCA uh, should be triggered after phase one. Is, the, is that correct, that uh, the number of employees after phase one, the trips should be enough to trigger that traffic light? Yes, it's our understanding from our traffic consultant that it should most likely be triggered, triggered with the first annual report, and if not, certainly with the second one. And um, thank you for, for being the stewards that you are. Thank you. Well said. Uh, Marcy. Okay. Um, I have a few questions and also some comments. Um, first, I'm very much looking forward to Palm Beach Gardens being the home of FPL. Uh, I've been driving by this site for years and years and years because I work also in West Palm Beach. So every single day I pass by it um, on 95 and I've been watching the construction and look forward to the grand opening and hope that I'm invited. Um, with that said, um, this is a, a beautiful building, very unique inside and outside actually. Um, and I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on some of the energy savings efforts that you've done on the inside of building two, because obviously building one, we know we've seen all the solar panels on the um, top of the garage, uh, top floor of it. And I didn't see that on the second floor of the second building. Um, so I was wondering, I've seen in other places where they have had you know, solar powered uh, lights in the parking lot, inside the structure, um, and other places. So I was curious about that. And Ken, you did um, answer a lot of my questions in your presentation. I did see the, the slide gate on the site plan, so I was a bit curious, but you said, and I'm just going to clarify, or maybe if you can clarify that those slide gates are not all the time, it's just for emergency purposes, and that would be the case for all the access points that have the slide gates on it, because they were on the, those. Um, and I'll just um, ask uh, the rest of my questions. Um, the other question was, uh, just out of curiosity, how many employees um, do you propose or do you expect to be occupying uh, both buildings as a whole, um, if you have that number? And also the water feature, very perfect part for a solar powered art and public places opportunity, just throwing that out there. And I also like uh, think that um, Rochelle's comments about following up on uh, after the fact is a really smart idea and I concur with that as well. I think that would be very interesting to see where they're coming from. Obviously we know your traffic is vested. Um, Traffic is always the concern of everybody. This will be a, a, a wonderful facility for all of your employees, and it is, it's gorgeous, but they do have to get in and out, and we all have to drive on the same roads that we're all driving on. So um, with that said, you being a big utility and uh, us with our city, I, I hope you help us in the efforts to maybe lobby DOT to advance 95's um, improvements uh, and also consider some of the out-of-the-box um, opportunities for traffic relief like staggering employee start and stop, uh, start and stop times as a, an option as well to help uh, relieve uh, the congestion. Thank you. Would you like me to respond to a few of those items, sure, Councilwoman? So uh, a lot of items there. So let me start with gates. First thing, I'm going to the easy one: the gates. The gates are 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 only to be used in an emergency, a lockdown situation on on the site. 
in regards to sustainability, obviously starting with the EV chargers and the ability to add additional 82 inside the building. It's all LED lights, natural sunlight comes through, specifically low, uh, low flow water, things are being used, LED lighting. So FPL has a very specific sustainability thing that they were very important as part of their, as part of their corporate mission. So certainly the inside will be energy efficient and all the items you'll see there. In regards to the traffic and the ability for, uh, for you in essence asked for about staggered start times, it, the way that FPL works that, that people can, they don't have a specific time, but when you look at their corporate campus, you'll see some people come at 7 a.m., some people come at 5, some people work. Mr. Mr. K, of course, Mr. Rosenthal work 24 hours a day, so they never leave. So there, there, there's <laughs> there you a go, lot. That helps so, right there. <laughs> right. So, so that will help with the peak hour movement, which I think was your, the basis of your question, Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Oh, number, oh, yes, yes, oh, yes. How could I forget the number of employees? A thou, approximately, the, the maximum is approximately 1,000 per building. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. More great statements. Mark? Well, grateful to be in a city that has um, the, the, the attraction of such a great company to, to set up their, their shop here. It would be crazy not to want to encourage that, um, to have another Fortune 500 country, uh, company right here in our backyard. The resiliency, the um, response to, to, tr um, to future storms uh, is only going to be a benefit to uh, all of our residents, not just in the city of Palm Beach Gardens, but everybody around us. So I think it's a, a kind of a, or, um, almost a no-brainer to say thank you <laughs> for, for coming. A couple questions. Um, thank you for the comment about the staggered times. Don and I, you spoke about that yesterday. I know you don't have a nine to five punch the clock, which is good because we all know the traffic is probably the biggest concern that everybody in this town is gonna to have as we move forward, as we see more, more work done. I know that the staff has done a ton of work preparing with the TOD um, to encourage multi-mode transportation. So I just want to make sure the residents know that we're not just popping up buildings without a plan to address the future traffic with the TOD, with, um, uh, Palm Tran with uh, hopeful um, uh, Brightline and Tri-Rail coming to the area. And I know that uh, our corporate partners are encouraging uh, those types of advancements along with the city. So that's, that's important for the residents to know and uh, for you guys to continue working on that. The last thing you want is angry residents and angry employees trying to get to work even though you have trucks crashing on I-95 at 5.30 on a Wednesday night. Um, other couple questions, uh, glass buildings. I know glass tends to draw heat. This type of glass is uh, tempered glass, I assume, to, to reduce or minimize any heat transference. Is that correct, I assume, yes? Yeah. Um, EV parking, are there any EV parking at the guest spots as well, or are they all internal? There is one. There's one in the guest area. One? So when I come and Rochelle come, we have both have our EVs. What are we going to do? One of us. Well, well, the, the, You're going to charge one thing it at home. But a total of two. One <laughs> charger, one two charger, spots. Two spots. Right. So you can well, both maybe come. maybe we can work on that, but, too. Right? But, 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 just, just a thought. I mean, it's nice that you're taking care of your residents and your, I'm sorry, your, uh, your employees, but don't think of the lowly guests that find a way in. Um, and why is there no solar panels on the phase two? I think I asked this question before and I forgot the answer. Sure. Uh, John Rosenthal, Florida Power and Light, uh, 700 Universe Boulevard. I have been sworn in. So as we've developed the program for building two, we've evaluated solar. We've evaluated also amenity features that could support our employee base. Um, it is something that is still being studied. Uh, but right now, what we've tried to do is preserve the ability to establish some sort of either use of amenity feature or potentially solar. It's something that is still being studied a little bit with our internal analysis. The shadow in the building placement, the position of the sun, there's a concern or there has been some concern about how productive and how efficient that energy, that solar array would be collecting the sun's rays. Because of the direction of the building? And because of the, yes, because of the position of the building, the position of the, the solar panels on that backside or north side of the building, the north side of the, on top of the garage. But we've preserved that capability and we are looking at it further. Um, so there may be something to report on that in the future uh, as we move forward. Okay, and the, and the berm that protects the parking garage is gonna be in place so you're not gonna see the, 
the, the edge of the parking garage by the time the building is open. Correct. It, it's got a, the berm is nine plus feet plus on top of that, we look to install anywhere between 30 to almost 45 foot high palms, very similar to the berm that's been established, the types of trees that have been established as part of phase one. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Questions? Carl? So I'm going to support it, but I'm going to tell you why, because uh, your community supports it. So it's not that, you know, we are voices of 60,000 people. We have Dave and Chip that sit on boards that, that reach out to community in, the other, in, in, in other ways that we do. So I've been involved with some HOA meetings in that direct area, um, not just recently, but over the years, discussing specifically these buildings and how they're going to affect the community. With line of sight, traffic is always going to be an issue. Um, but I haven't had one complaint in there. It was uh, the creation of jobs. And what I learned early on as a council member, probably from just being around people who know how to run cities, is technology-based businesses need are really the forward thinking. And I, and I know we did the carrier building a while back. Um, that was a milestone, I feel, and we went over there and we did a, uh, a walkthrough. It was magical. I mean, even the elevator was wide open for you to see the mechanics of it. Um, and this is, this blows that away. So this is, this is um, something that's not even regional. It's, it's something that's important to the entire state of Florida, and we get to be in partnership with Florida Power and Light. And Don, you and I, I remember you taking me on the build, top floor of the Juno building and just... I don't even remember, you had plants or something up there. You were forward thinking with technology and, and power. So um, it's good that we can speak on behalf of you know, the people that vote for us to vote for you. We all have relationships with you guys and random people expect us to have the knowledge to vote for them because they vote for us every few years. So I appreciate that. So. Um, that's really all I have to say, but uh, the stupid question I have is the fence that's going to go around it, is that going to be, because, you know, we're always important with setbacks in the city. Is the fence going to be set back enough where it's really out of line of sight of traffic and, uh, uh, and pedestrians, or is it going to be more of a deterrence? Because we know they're going to have high-tech cameras. So the perimeter fence is proposed on the south and west boundary, so the north and east along Kyoto and RCA don't have fences. Right, but the fences that are in place, are they going to be set back into the landscaping where they're not visible to pedestrian traffic, or is it going to be more of a deterrence? Because I know along the east roadway where the maybe the main security gate will be, that'll probably be visible, but are we concealing that in any way? or? Any portions of the fence that are visible do have landscaping. Okay. All right. So other than that, I just want, I thought it was important to let you know that the meetings that I've had with the associations, not one negative thing, jobs, 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 high technology. So it seems to me that our constituents, um, especially in the North End, right around Military and Elm, those people, they're on for it. So I'm on for it too. So I appreciate your time. Nice job, Ken. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys for your excellent questions. It's wonderful to hear the, the important thoughts for our residents coming out of all of us up here. That's what we're here for. And um, I want to thank this group for being good neighbors to the people around you. That's, that's something we always ask for, and we've seen it from the very beginning with Florida Power and Light. And as you guys are um, going to lead decarbonizing America, to have you do it right here in our backyard is extraordinarily cool that those buildings will be the landmark for an extraordinary decision that will affect the entire country. Um, and also, you know, obviously we, we love talking about mobility, TOD, and, and chargers, so thank you for working so hard on adding the driveways and the, ex the internal mobility as well as the extra lanes in and out. I know that's very difficult with the amount of security you have to have so allowing for that as well. I'm glad my fellow council members mentioned traffic. That's always the first thing residents always want to talk about. Uh, and for you, you want your you know, almost 2,000 employees to be able to get in and out of work so they can help take care of us. So I also appreciate, we all do, all, all the work you've done, all the way to covering bus shelters, which is something that even on the TPA we're working on 
making sure everyone has a safe and, and we had to have safe and beautiful bus shelters. So thank you for taking that seriously as well. And the ped bike access and Rochelle's bike lanes, I'm sorry, bike rack is gonna be extraordinary. So uh, my only question is how are we looking on timing? What are we uh, for phase one opening up and employees coming in and phase two? So uh, for phase one, occupancy is probably any day. Um, we're just wrapping up a couple uh, minor items, items with staff and inspections. So could be tomorrow, could be a couple days, but it's definitely in the works. Um, and we've been having a great relationship with staff getting through everything. So for building two, um, we're looking at uh, ideal um, uh, July, August start of construction. Everything goes, continues to develop drawings developed, et cetera, permits in place. And then we're anticipating roughly around a 31, 32 month construction, which would put us around the end of 2025, beginning of 2026. Excellent, thank you very much. All right, with that, we are not having any further discussion. Anyone have a second comment? No? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes. Congratulations, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you all so much for coming. All right, moving on to Ordinance 15, if our clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 15, 2022, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, annexing pursuant to a petition for voluntary annexation, 18 parcels of real property comprising a total of 10.97 acres, more or less in size, located on the southwest corner of the intersection of PGA Boulevard and Ellison Wilson Road in Palm Beach County, Florida that is more particularly described herein, declaring that the voluntary annexation petition bears the signatures of the owners of the real property annexed hereby, amending Article 2 of the City Charter by redefining the corporate limits, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of State, the Palm Beach County Clerk of Courts, and Palm Beach County, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you, Patty. All right, so I'm going to open the hearing. Hello. Oh, I, before Sorry, I we Go open ahead. the hearing, mm -hmm. um, I need to recuse myself. Um, my husband, my husband's company, they're the company that my husband works for, is a consultant of the property owner. So I'm going to recuse myself and step away from the Thank day you so well. much. My apologies. There you go. Okay. Sorry. Martin, please. Good Thank to you, see Madam you. Mayor. Um, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council. For the record, my name is Martin Fitz, Planning and Zoning. Now, I'd have a very brief presentation for you uh, for Ordinance 15, 2022. This is a voluntary annexation petition for 18 parcels totaling approximately 10.97 acres. It's located on the southwest corner of the intersection of PGA Boulevard and Ellison Wilson Road. <clears throat> Excuse me. For those of you uh, who are probably familiar with this location as the former Panama Hatties, it's directly across the street, from, or across the canal, rather, from the Waterway Cafe. Uh, a little background, the site um, is owned by DMBH Residential and PGA Landing. Uh, it previously had uh, commercial properties and uh, several residential homes. Those have all been uh, cleared off now and the parcels are currently vacant. The site was approved uh, through Palm Beach County for 98 condo units in three towers and a <clears throat> with parking in two um, two levels below the buildings. Uh, it also is approved for a 23 slip commercial marina. And we have the site plan here. I will note that there are, with this annexation, there are no additional changes being approved. Uh, it, everything was reviewed through the county and all the, all the um, levels of service met the county standards. And we are simply bringing the approval from the county into the city with this annexation. Uh, I'd like to show you a few renderings of what the, uh, was approved through the county for the elevations. This would be from the northwest, which would be like from slightly above the, the um, drawbridge, and from the north southeast. <clears throat> and this, the project is a, a uh, branded Ritz-Carlton residences. And they are uh, currently conducting uh, infrastructure work on the site uh, as we speak. Well, maybe not right now, but uh, 
Staff did review the annexation petition for consistency with state statutes, and it does meet all the criteria. It is within uh, the annexation area of interest 22, and it does meet all of the city's level of service standards. This petition has been duly noticed. Uh, we have uh, both with mailers and uh, property posting, and we did, uh, uh, consistent with the county's voluntary annexation ordinance, we did notify the county administrator and the planning director, and we have not to date received anything from the county. I will note that this parcel or this project is not within the uh, rural unincorporated protection area, so it does not require a supermajority vote by the county commission for approval. This did go to the planning, zoning, and, and appeals uh, board last night and was recommended with a vote of 7 0 for approval. Staff also recommends approval of Ordinance 15 2022 on first reading as recommended, as presented. And uh, staff is available if you have any questions, as are the, uh, the applicant. Thank you, Martin. All right, I don't have any comment cards, so I'm going to close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve, please? I'll make a motion to approve Ordinance 15 2022. I'll second. All right, wonderful. Let's bring it back for discussion. Carl, you made your motion. Do you have any questions? It's a, again, in partnership with people who know how to do, put up buildings, because we're experiencing that in the train station now. So, I mean, it, right now, I just think we just need to get it into the city and, and move forward with it. And it looks like a good project. It's going to come under the umbrella of staff. And we definitely have capable developers. Um, we know that in partnership with them. And I'm excited just to vote for it and let them have it. Thank you. Mark? Uh, thank you guys for, for coming tonight and bringing this. This is another um, easy, easy, um, easy sell for us. A couple questions, though, and I apologize. I didn't uh, think about these until I saw some pictures. Where is the entrance? How far from the corner of PGA and Ellison Wilson is the main entrance into the project? <clears throat> the main entrance is... Um, is about in the middle of the, of the site location, and it's directly across the street from the entrance into city center. Got it. And I remember years ago when this project was, uh, was thought to come into the city, there was some concessions made for our fire trucks to get in and making sure that we had enough turning radius and what have you. And so I'm assuming all that is still in play. Yes, sir. And in fact, when this, uh, I forgot to mention, when this uh, plan was going through the uh, commission approval process. Uh, staff did receive uh, courtesy copies and our DRC did look at it and provided comments, including um, the fire access and police, and those comments were incorporated into the approval. Thank you. Uh, what is the height from the road? I know that really drops pretty fast from Ellison Wilson down to the water. What, so I know it's uh, whatever memory stories the buildings are, but when you're standing on the road there, how high is it gonna be from eye level? The height uh, of the buildings from the grade is about 67 feet. Uh, so when you're at the uh, when you're at Ellison Wilson, it'll it'll be approximately 67 feet from that area. From from the height of Ellison Wilson, and so from the from the water level, I guess it'll be it'll be closer. The actual height from the from the base floor is about 96 feet. Okay. Uh, so 67 feet, which is that, that's comparable to the buildings across the street, right? I, I'm not. I'm not we don't exceed those buildings. It's close. Yeah. Well, because you know, when you're on the water level, obviously it's higher. When you're on the road, because it's such a drop, it won't seem nearly as uh, high from, from the Ellison Wilson. And then the last question, 23 docks, uh, 23 spots uh, in the marina. How big of boats can you fit there? I just had a curiosity, and that, that it matters. But... Can you come to the microphone, please? Yeah. Shopping for a boat, make sure I can put it somewhere. You're going to get a 75 foot yacht. Good evening, Dan Kettlefield, for the record. Um, the marina was approved probably seven years ago by the DEP. Um, the boats can be up to 75 feet. They stagger in length. Um, in water is 75, 55s, and then on lifts up to 35 and 45 foot. And so there's only 23 lifts, and you have 98 residences there, so... Who gets to fight for the slips? Um, right now, it's almost about 30% of the residents do want boat lifts, and the, the rest just use them. Once we brought the Ritz-Carlton brand, 
most of the residents already have one, if not already two condominiums that they go to. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there you go. Thanks, Mark. Rochelle? If there's one thing that perplexes our residents to no end, it's how you can have a Palm Beach Gardens address but still not be considered part of the city of Palm Beach Gardens. And the area around Prosperity and Ellis and Wilson is one of those areas where I get questions all the time. So it, it's a no-brainer to me to, to want to bring as much of that into the city and make us uniform as possible. And certainly having this project in this location with now the Ritz-Carlton brand, I mean, it was great before, but having that on top of it is, is a cherry on the top. Um, the only question I have going forward has to do with the bridge itself. Has there been any, any discussion, any changes planned or needed to that bridge uh, because of the project? Uh, at all? No? Okay. Uh, for concurrency purposes, none for the bridge, none. Matter of fact, last year we left, this year we let DOT use our property to actually put mats around the bridge, no, nothing to do with our property. They just couldn't access their bridge, so they used ours, our property as a staging area. And that's one of the cranes that you probably saw there during construction but there's, there's no needed. Um, about 15 years ago, I petitioned, when I almost bought Panama Hatties back then, um, to actually have the county help us get approved having the concrete grates put in so you don't hear the tire noise. That was done 15 years ago when I about this close from buying it. So I'm glad I, we actually did that. <laughs> oh, we're thinking, okay. Well, thank you. All right, well, thank you for that history, too. That's great, interesting. I, I don't see any issue with this at all. We look forward to welcoming you appropriately to Palm Beach Gardens. So let's uh, bring it to vote. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Welcome to the beginning of being in Palm Beach Gardens. <laughs> thank you. We're moving on to public hearings. If the clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 13, 2022, and Ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 2, Administration, by repealing Section 2-294, Bidding Threshold, and readopting same as revised, in order to amend certain purchasing limits and remove certain reference to state law, providing that the remainder of Chapter 2, Administration, shall remain in full force and effect as previously enacted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. I'm going to open the hearing. Has anything changed since first reading? Yes, Madam Mayor, we had a, a lot of questions and things brought up at the first reading. We want to attempt to address those questions you have and uh, present you that information. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm a little snuffed up. <laughs> um, for the record, is Kumra, Purchasing and Contracts Director. Um, Ordinance 13, I'm going to go through a little quick recap of what Ordinance 13 is, and then I'll present some, pre present some additional information. Uh, with me is Alan Owens, our finance administrator, and he also has some information that he will also um, present. Um, the, the, the ordinance does two things. It codifies the contracting authority for city manager, and it raises the contracting threshold from 65,000 to 0.5% of the approved budget, which is approximately a million dollars. It addresses certain issues with supply chain logistics, it mitigates our exposure to price increases, and it addresses issues caused by time delays of waiting for city council approval. Of course, the results is that it saves taxpayers money, it expedites the procurement process, it saves time, and again, it clarifies the contracting authority for certain government agencies that we get grant forms, like um, the Department of Economic Opportunity, opportunity um, other areas of the state, and the federal government. Of course, this, this, this ordinance has raised a lot of rancor and a lot of concerns. Um, there's been resistance to change. There have been questions about transparency and accountability. None of that changes. 
And what I show you next will we'll, we'll bring that out. The, the professional standards and the best practices that are uh, postulated by the National Institute for Governmental Purchasing and the National Procurement Institute, the preeminent public procurement organizations, is that if a project comes to the governing body for approval in your line item budget that lists the projects, that that item should not come back for contract award because that becomes an administrative and professional um, function. The ordinance proposes 0.5% because we you know a lot of people, it's very hard for them to swallow that, then nothing comes back. So the ordinance proposes 0.5% and not a fixed amount because $65,000 20 years ago doesn't have the buying power of $65,000 today. And so, so it's not to be in the same position 10 years from now fighting over this ordinance. 0.5% allows it as the budget adjusts, whether up or down, the contracting authority will shift along with it. So whether we have inflation or deflation, it will shift with it. Now, I think it's opportune now for me to show you a flow chart of our purchasing process to address the concerns about transparency and accountability. Now, the first step in the purchasing process is that the user department has to submit a request and says to me, they want to buy something. They want to buy a horse, they want to buy a monkey, they want to buy a dog, whatever they want to buy. They have to submit a request to me and say they want to buy something. And that it's this project number, and we have the money in the budget for this, it's in this funding information. This is the funding, the funding data for that. And then the purchasing department performs market research. It's a written market research that I, I go and I, I identify in the market research. What is it we're buying? For which department? How do we use it? Do we have an existing contract? Is that contract expiring? Um, who did we buy from the last time? Do we, did we have issues with the vendor performance, et cetera, et cetera? I, I, I then look at how do we mitigate the risk for this? How did the department come up with the budget? This is the budget amount they're, that they're proposing, but how did they arrive with it? All that is documenting, documented in the market research. At the end of all of that, there's a determination as to whether or not we do an RFP, an ITB, an RFQ, or we piggyback a contract. All that is all documented in it, so that 50 years from now when Krumer is no longer here, hopefully, and somebody comes and looks at it and says, why did they do this? Or the IG asks me a question, why did we do this? I send them a copy of the market research report, and they can see, oh, okay, okay, I understand that. Because the state actually requires that you document, if you don't do an ITB, then why did you choose to do something else? The purchasing department then drafts the solicitation. And I work with the user department to develop the specifications. And, and the idea of working with the user department is sometimes the user department knows what they want. They know they want a, an Audi A4, right? This is what they have used. But you can go out there and say, you know, to be transparent and fair to everybody, to everybody who can. And you, you say to them, why do you want an Audi A4? Oh, it has quattro four-wheel drive. And, and we, we have snow. But Jeep has something else, and Mercedes has formatic. So you, you, have to, you have to craft the specifications so that they're fair and equitable, so that everybody out there who can provide a four-wheel drive sedan can bid on it. So I work with departments for that, and we develop the specifications together. When the draft solicitation is completed, it is submitted for review. It is reviewed by risk. Risk looks at the insurance clause, to make sure the insurance clause mitigates the risk for the city and that we can protect ourselves in case something happens. It's, look, it's looked at by finance to make sure, yes, this, was in, this is an item that is in the line item budget, and we had the money put aside to this. It's looked at by the user department to make sure that, yes, this is what we discussed we want to buy. We want to buy a horse, not a dog or a monkey or something like that. And then legal, the city attorney looks at it too to make sure that this because all the clauses and the terms and conditions within the solicitation are, at the end of the day, going to be incorporated into the final contract. So legal has to look at it to make sure all the clauses are fine and we don't have anything in there that's going to expose the city unnecessarily. After all of that, then the solicitation is advertised. It is advertised on our e-procurement portal, Mercer USA. It is sent to a vendor's list. It is placed in the Palm Beach Post, and it's placed on the city website. A copy is given to the inspector general, a copy to the city clerk, and a copy to the user department to say, hey, we have advertised this, and now we're waiting for the bids or the offers or the proposals. 
if vendors ask a question while the solicitation is on the street, then an addendum is posted. The vendor has to send, because we have a cone of silence, the vendor has to send that question in writing. Then I have to draft an addendum which responds to that question. For example, if the vendor asks, you say you want a blue horse, right, for argument. And he says, hey, I sell horses. I have pink horses. They're just as good as blue horses. Here's the specifications to show we did an independent lab test. Pink horses are just as good as blue horses, right? Then I have to go back to the user department and say, hey, this guy says he has pink horses. They're just as good as blue horses. And then the user department may say, yeah, that's fine. Or no, no, we want blue horses to match the existing blue horses that we have. And then I have to put a response in the addendum, in writing, and post that. That addendum is, again, to our e-procurement website. It goes to the e-procurement portal, to the vendors list, to the city website, to the inspector general, and to the city clerk. So everybody gets to see that, yeah, the city will take a pink horse, or no, you have to, you have to bid on a blue horse. If there's a pre-bid conference or site visit, for example, we do construction projects, we usually have the contractors, potential contractors come in, and we look at the construction site, so they become familiar, and they will say, okay, where's my, where am I gonna stage, where am I gonna lay down stuff, et cetera. And we, we publicly notice that. We publicly notice that so that everybody who wants to come can come. A copy is sent to the inspector general, is sent to the city clerk, the user department. Usually, the, if it's a construction project, we have, we have Todd here, the city engineer, and David, and anybody who has anything to do with that project. And it's also posted on the city's website. There's a public big opening. So when the due date comes, we have a public bid opening. Before COVID, we used to have the bid openings right here in Chambers. And the city clerk would record them, and anybody who wanted to listen in or come attend could come and see us visibly and, and publicly open the bids and see that nobody came in late and nobody's stuff was stuck in or unopened or whatever. Nothing funny was going on. Because of COVID, what we're doing now are called virtual bid openings. So there's a link, for example, if you go to the link now on the purchasing department website, there's a link to a bid opening happening in, in, in January. And anybody, it's like a webinar, anybody in the entire world can click on it on that date, at that time, at three o'clock on January 27, 2023, and watch the city clerk log in to the portal, the e-procurement portal, watch her enter her password, which you can't see the actual password, and watch the vault <laughs> open. And you can see all the persons who have submitted proposals for this project. Everybody can watch it. See that it's very transparent, it's very open. The IG is also copied. The city clerk is also, of course, invited, and it's on the city's website. After we open all the bids and proposals, the law says I have about 30 days. I have 30 days, actually, before I provide a tabulation to everybody who submitted a bid. I usually do it the same day. I, pre I, pre I prepare a preliminary bid tabulation by five o'clock and I send it out to everybody who responded to the bid and said, here's your preliminary bid tabulation, here's what, this is not the final bid tabulation, it's a preliminary bid tabulation provided for informational purposes only. So if somebody says, hey, that's not what I, that's not the price I submitted. I can say, yeah, yeah, here's, here's a screenshot of what you submitted and this is what you submitted. But it's provided for informational purposes and to be as transparent as possible. After the preliminary bid tabulation is, is, is distributed, then the evaluation process begins. And if we have a selection committee, we publicly notice and we have a public selection committee meeting right in here. We have selection committee meetings where they can review the proposals and they can vote on it and they can score it, et cetera, and we come to a consensus. But before all of that happens during the evaluation, I have to determine if the vendors, each vendor is responsive and whether the vendor is responsible, because that's what the law requires. A responsive vendor is a vendor who, I, I, I put a solicitor and ask for a horse. If you send me a, a, a bid for a dog, you're not responsive. That's not what I ask for, right? If I ask for, to build a fire station, you send me to build a maintenance shed, you're not a responsive vendor. If you refused, if you didn't sign your, your, your bid electronically, we're not going to accept you. You're non-responsive. So a responsible vendor is a vendor who is in the business of doing that kind of whatever good or service or commodity we're asking for. For example, a guy who makes shoes, 
you can't ask him to sell your horse, right? Because he makes shoes. So that would not be a responsible vendor. In addition, I go to the state websites. So the state has complaints lists, the state, the state has vendors lists where vendors who have been disbarred by the state. I check the federal government website, SAM, where vendors who have taxes owed or have some kind of debarment from the federal government. And I, I check Yelp, I check the Better Business Bureau. I check to make sure that this is a vendor that the city can do business with and not, get in, not, not, not have a due risk or create problems. So all of that is documented in a responsiveness review report and a responsibility review report. So anybody can pull it up and look at it and say, hey, this is why we chose this vendor. He offered to sell a horse for $10, but he's really a carpenter. And we didn't choose him. We chose the other guy who chose to sell us a horse for a lot more, but who's a responsible vendor. After all of that is done, then we do a, I do a draft award recommendation for concurrence. That draft award recommendation includes a final bill tabulation, the award recommendation that says um, recommend an award to X vendor and Y, and a copy of all the bids received. And that is sent to the user department for them to review. The user department, if they don't concur, has to say to me in writing why they don't concur. And 100% of the times, they will concur and say, yes, we agree, or why did you select this vendor? And I say, read the responsiveness report or read the responsibility report. After that is done, the award recommendation and the final bid tabulation is posted. It's posted on the e-procurement portal, Mercer USA. It is posted on the vendors list. It is posted on the city's website. A copy is sent to the inspector general, and a copy is sent to the city clerk. Then I draft the agreement. And the draft agreement is then reviewed by the user department and the vendor. The user department looks at it to make sure, yes, we're buying a horse, and the vendor looks at it to make sure his name is correct, all the, all the terms and conditions that we talked about in the solicitation are incorporated by reference, and this is the bid he submitted, et cetera. After that, the draft agreement is submitted to the city attorney to review and process. So the city attorney looks at it for legal sufficiency. The final draft contract is then routed for signatures, and that goes to the vendor, to the requester from the department to sign off on it to say yes. The contract administrator is going to administrate the contract in the department, the department head, finance, the city attorney, the purchasing director, and the deputy city manager. <clears throat> After all of those people sign off and say yes, we agree to this, and this is in the budget, and this was agreed to, and this is what we want. We're not buying a Porsche 911 Turbo S. We're buying a horse because we need a horse, and it's in the budget. Then it goes to the city manager. Only then does the city manager seize it. Then it goes to the city manager for signature, if it's within his authority, or for him to sign off to send it to you for final approval. A copy of the contract is then distributed by the city clerk, and then it's not even done then. After all of that is done, like tonight, all of the contracts you approved on um, the consent agenda, after that is done, the user department has to create a requisition for a purchase order because we have to encumber the funds. We have to take that amount of money out of the budget and put it aside specifically to buy this horse or whatever we're buying. And the requisition is rooted by the requester, it's reviewed by the department head, and it's approved. The department head sees it, risk sees it, and they have to sign off on it. It doesn't move forward if risk says, or if the department head says, no, I don't agree with this, then it doesn't move any further. If risk says, I, haven't, I don't have the insurance for this vendor, then it doesn't move further. When all of that is done, it comes to the person director who looks and says, yeah, this is the solicitation I did, this is the agreement we get to do, this is what I did, and then finance finally signs off on it. The purchase order is then generated for, from the requisition, and the purchase order is transmitted to the vendor. The vendor is then authorized to sell the city a horse, or whatever the city wants. After that, the vendor delivers the horse. The contract administrator has to check to make sure this is a horse to buy, and then the vendor gets paid, and then the contract file is closed. Can you tell me what in that process is not transparent or accountable? If not, then I'm going to leave it to Alan to try and convince you otherwise about the ordinance. Thank you, Kumra. No pressure there, right? Um, let's see. So what we did in finance, <clears throat> we, 
we did a, a study, an analysis of the proposed changes that Kumra went through with you, um, assuming that these changes had been in effect last fiscal year, ending 9-30-2022. What we found out, looking back, there were 32 contracts that came before council for review and approval uh, using the current threshold of $65,000. Those contracts had a value of $26.6 million. If the proposed change had been in effect last year, that total would have been reduced to eight contracts with a total dollar value of <clears throat> $18.9 million. So the total number would have reduced by 24 from 32 to eight. Doesn't sound like a lot, but 24 agenda items would literally be hundreds of hours, thousands of dollars of staff time. And again, by doing that change, you still would have captured almost or over 71% of the total dollar values that council would have approved. Another thing I'd like to point out is that, you know, when council approves the annual budget, the line item budget, which is a policy document um, each year that sets forth the spending plan for the coming year to uh, try to um, meet the city's goals and objectives and initiatives for the coming year. After the council approves that document, there are a whole host, actually a majority of expenditures throughout the year that are, incur are incurred without ever having to go back to council for further review and approval. Uh, this schedule just shows some of the more significant items, personnel and line items in operating accounts, which totaled over $103 million last year. So you can see the vast majority of expenditures that are incurred to achieve the city's uh, sp spending plan for the, each year are incurred as a normal course of business over the course of the 12 months of the fiscal year. The city has a very uh, strong system of internal controls and policies and procedures uh, that govern not just procurement, but all the different cycles of transactions from payroll to accounts payable to cash receipts, investments, all of these policies and procedures and internal controls are reviewed by our external auditors every year when they do the annual audit. Uh, they test uh, transactions to search for any issues of non-compliance or exceptions. They're required to prepare a report on internal controls uh, and compliance as part of the annual comprehensive financial report. They also are required to prepare a management letter for council's review noting any areas of um, not specific issues of non-compliance uh, with uh, laws, procedures, state statutes, those types of things, for, and issue uh, areas of recommendations for improvement. Uh, that entire report and those reports on internal controls are then sent to the state auditor general. Uh, so there's multiple layers of review uh, and throughout the year, then, in finance, uh, staff prepares a very comprehensive um, financial reports throughout the year, quarterly reports that, uh, to enable the council to exercise your oversight responsibility to make sure that staff is um, heading in the right direction, look at your actual expenditures compared to the budget, make sure that staff is operating within the constraints of the budget. We also highlight uh, significant items such as capital, purchases, CIP progress, those types of things. There's an investment uh, status report also. And with a new system, the OpenGov reporting system, those would be available online so anybody can look, including council at any point in time and get an idea of the actual expenditures versus budget year to date. So you can see there's a very comprehensive um, system of checks and balances in place. Uh, it would catch uh, significant um, omissions or non-compliance with any types of uh, internal controls or policies and procedures. So for these reasons, uh, in order to improve efficiency and effectiveness and to save time and money, staff is recommending approval of Ordinance 13, 2022. Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. Just a couple of comments. Please. Uh, the issues that were brought up at the last council meeting and ever since then about transparency and accountability, I think we've addressed the best that we can. Uh, the issues of city manager and power and that kind of thing, regardless of who the city manager is or who's sitting up here as an elected official, 
that changes. That's going to change, constantly change. So I don't mean anything personal about that. <laughs> I think you all are doing a great job right here. I don't want to change today. But I, I think it's, it's understood that the process is always going to be there. The law is always going to be there. There's opportunities to change process and law, but not from internally. You know, none of us are going to change a law. None of us are going to change a procedure that is uh, an ordinance. So I think we address that as well. Uh, I want you to understand the intent. Uh, when this was brought to me and was discussed, I was kind of skeptical myself. And then as we went along and along and along, I was even more convinced that this is the right way to go. And the, the, the reason is, if we look at this thing the way we try to look at everything, is how does this apply globally to our situation? When you look at the international, the national, and the state economy, the way things are going now, you look at the supply chain, you look at the changing prices, and even the availability. I couldn't even get furniture. It took me 12 months to get furniture. Uh, that's amazing to me. But when we're buying materials and supplies, or our contractors are buying materials and supplies, there are delays in deliveries, which cost time, which is money. There are delays in delivery uh, in which the cost, uh, once our contractors get a cost, by the time it's delivered, it's increased in price. So it isn't about power. It's trying to find the most efficient and effective way to deliver our services and to do, to do construction, too. So we're trying to meet the need of the operation by changing the ordinance. I don't write checks. I don't initiate purchases. I'm the tail end of the process. And whoever your city manager is, they're the tail end of the process. Everything is vetted and justified and warranted and deemed legal at that point. Everything that is purchased has got to be in the budget that, you, that council has already approved or it won't even get to me. So the checks, the balances, the transparency, the accountability, it's all there. And as a staff, we felt that this was the right way to go because it's the right thing to do to get the services and the, the structures and infrastructure done for this. We're all on the same page. We want to do that for our residents. It isn't about me, and it's really not about you. It's about the residents getting the, the, the services and the facilities in the most efficient and effective way we can. We're all on the same boat of saving taxpayer dollars. I believe this can save taxpayer dollars. I believe it can get us to the, uh, our services to the residents even quicker. When you look at what you did for the, the city and the residents when we had the $30 million um, sales tax, uh, that got done so fast and the facilities were built so fast because you gave us the authority to move on that that everyone that you talked to was amazed. They've got cities out there still waiting to get their money before they decide to spend it. But that was done, and so by result of that, uh, we moved those projects on real fast, and the residents are enjoying those facilities and the services provided. We did the same thing with the Gardens North County District Park, one year, unheard of. One year it was done, because you gave us the authority to spend that money. So these are some examples of what this, this ordinance can do about providing services and protecting taxpayer dollars. That's all this is about as far as we are concerned. I don't know what other agendas are being played out there. We're getting some disturbing responses. I'm being called names, hurt my feelings. But it's okay, people don't understand what what our intent is. Our intent is to do good. So that's where I'm coming from, and now I'll be quiet. Thank you.
So I'm going to, we don't have any comment cards, so I'm going to close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve? I'll make a motion Mayor? on Ordinance 1320. Excuse me, Mayor. Yeah. Oh. There, you do have a comment. I, okay, was it for David Levy? Yes. Okay, I apologize. David Levy, my fault. Please come on up. My mistakes. Sorry about the interruption. Oh, it wasn't turned on. Mr. Levy, if you could state your name and address. David Levy, 4788 Holly Drive, Palm Beach Gardens. And one of the reasons why I oppose this ordinance is because of the competency of the staff. Uh, this, going back in the history of the city, before I actually was on the council, we had a disaster here. Ron fixed that disaster. And I, what I'm a little bit afraid of is that Alan is now retiring. Good luck and congratulations. I'm sorry you're not going to be my neighbor anymore. But, uh, you know, you're going to have changes with the staff. And although I do think that there are protections in place, you know, when the days were here, when Namara Martinez was here, I will say his name, there was a lot of corruption in this city. There was a lot of corruption when John Orr was here. And part of the reason why this is going to work is because Kumar is honestly the most competent purchase agent I've ever seen. I, I say that with great respect. But I also want to make another little point, and that's to you, as a former council member to the current council. And one of the things that kept me, uh, kept my finger on the pulse of what was going on in the city was our staff meetings. And one of my opinions is the most important thing that we do as council members is our fiduciary responsibility, which means that you need to know where the money is going. And when those are on your staff meetings and staff gives you the presentation on why this is something that's needed, I think that's important knowledge for you to have, especially if a resident comes and asks you, well, what is this that we just bought? Why did we buy two new fire engines? Why did we buy five new police cars? You know, what was the matter with the old ones? And by having your staff meeting, you have those answers. I think an informed council is very important so that you can talk to me, the residents, because I don't come to these meetings anymore. I don't have staff meetings anymore. I rely on you guys to do that. So I'm in opposition of this, basically because of the 1.1 million. I know that's variable cap. If we could do something maybe a little bit lower that's more in line, maybe a percentage of, instead of I think you said 0.5%, maybe 0.2% or 0.1% that would bring that cap down, I think it would be better for our residents and better for our city, and honestly would make you better council members. Thank you for your time, and I got 30 seconds left. Thank you, my apologies for that. So I am going to close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve, please? I'll make a motion on ordinance 1220, I'm sorry, 13 2022 to approve. I'll second. All right, I'm gonna switch it up. Mark, would you like to start tonight? Um, sure. Uh, great presentation, uh, Kumra, Alan. Uh, Alan, thank you for everything you've done for me over the years. I've learned a lot from you. You've taught me how to properly analyze budgets, uh, the difference between government budgets and private budgets and small business budgets. So. Uh, good luck in whatever, wherever your retirement takes you. Um, I thought a lot, a lot, a lot about this uh, over the past month and a half since we met, or two months and a half, I guess, in this first reading. Um, and although I completely understand all of the uh, checks and balances in place and they're not going anywhere, uh, the optics just is, is not good. Um, I don't care so much about what people say in these silly text messages, and I don't know who's sending them all out. And the misinformation and disinformation uh, bothers me because this is the city of Palm Beach Gardens. This is not Congress, and we don't need that type of silliness. And whoever, whatever political consultant is out there that's crafting these languages, please stop. Um, if you want to talk to any of us, we are at the ball fields with you. We are at Publix with you. We're at the local restaurants. We don't need this kind of nonsense. And you all know our phone numbers. Um, so that doesn't change my opinion in any way, shape, or form. Um, I, I welcome resident input because we don't get much of it, but not that type of resident input. Uh, but 
that being said, um, you know, talking to other people, talking to other municipalities, talking to our neighbors, to our friends. I serve on the finance and audit board for the healthcare district. We had a meeting today. Um, the purchasing um, power of the uh, CEO of the healthcare district is $250,000 on a budget that's double what our budget is. So to ask, to, to, to suggest that moving from $65,000, which is woefully low, to $1.2 million or whatever it is uh, this year is, is just a big, big step. I know you said baby steps, Kumra, but this is not a baby step in the minds and the, in the hearts of the people and the community who we represent. We are the ones that get the brunt of the uh, concern. Uh, people that don't like things come to us. We are the elected officials. We're supposed to watch and be the other side of government and staff. And when we give up all of that responsibility, even though it all, all isn't there, it doesn't look good upon us. And I don't think that's something that's fair to ask. Um, I would be more than happy to, to come with a lower number. And I think tying it to budget is important because you don't want to have to keep coming back to this. And I don't know if anyone's going to want to um, consider adding a, an alternate or an amended um, ordinance. But that's another conversation. The other thing too was, you know, we've been going through a pretty high uh, short term, major fluctuations in inflation over the past year, uh, but that's gonna wane. Um, so to, to change things because of what we saw the past six, eight months, I don't think is necessary. We just pass as a county, a housing bond because of the concern about affordable housing. And yet I think we're gonna find in a year or two as the markets readjust, uh, the need for that housing bond may not be necessary, but it was a reaction to something that was happening today. And uh, because of that, uh, I don't know if that was absolutely necessary. That, that Obviously, it's not the same thing, but it's an example of how we get all worked up over something in the short term, when in reality, if you just wait for things to kind of get back to normal, um, things will get back to normal. And those added expenses to our residents, I don't think are going to be continued. The other thing that I really think about is, you know, Term limits keeps us up here for a very short period of time. Um, the, the institutional knowledge of the elected officials is short. Um, and passing ordinances today that are going to impact those two folks that are going to come up here in just a couple of months, I don't think is fair. Uh, I, I think that I don't want to put a burden on them, especially on a situation like this. If they feel that it's something that they would like to address at this level, that's perfectly fine. Uh, with only three or four months left, I'm trying to not do or say or create policies or things that are going to handcuff or do things that the next council isn't going to um, want to engage in. So um, I think that uh, you may want to consider having conversations with the next council um, because when I'm not here, uh, my time, I don't want to put, put a burden on them that I don't think is fair to them. So um, in this current set of numbers, I'm going to vote no. However, if we as a council tonight, or if you guys in the future want to change that, I would encourage changing it to a number that's more in line with other municipalities in the county. Thank you. Thank you, Mark Rochelle. I want to thank Kumra for that detailed presentation. Uh, when I received it the first time in agenda review, it really opened my eyes to to what the process is and and how it moves and and it's understandable why you've won the number of awards that you are and how lucky we are to have you. Um, that being said, I've had the same concerns as my colleagues, as others I've talked to about what happens when there is change, when, when purchasing changes, when finance changes, when the city manager changes and how we protect it. And if you could explain again, or Max, because I believe Max might have been the one who explained during the agenda review, some of that is state mandated and some of it is policy. What would prevent a future administration or, or council or city manager from changing that flow chart so things don't proceed <clears throat> that way? If, if someone were to change the policy, say, say a new city manager came in and decided to just tip over the apple cart and um, completely redo our purchasing policies, procedures manual, um, 
Well, I think, first of all, they, they certainly could, it, it, part of it. Um, there are certain, certain things under public construction and things that are subject to CCNA um, that are uh, governed by state law. There are other parts of our procurement policies that they could change. Um, and then we would undoubtedly get um, a bunch of management comments when our uh, combined annual financial report is done. Um, you guys know that we have independent auditors that audit us every year and they look at our finances and they look at our checks and balances and the controls and the way that we spend money and the way that we allocate money and they offer management comments about whether or not you have proper checks and balances in. And I've represented cities in the past that got significant management comments every single year because they didn't have sufficient internal, what they call internal controls. I think that's the term, isn't it, Alan? Internal controls. Um, and if you don't have those proper internal controls, they make comments about it. You also will still have the oversight and the requirement to inform the IG of your procurement policies. And so if they start seeing suddenly, um, you know, this mat this radical change in our internal controls and our, and our purchasing procedures, you're going to get comments. I think Kumra gave an example during one of the agenda reviews uh, previously where um, we had, he sent something to the IG and they questioned um, what the approval was or how it went, and the IG immediately questioned and came back to Kumra over it. I don't remember what that was, Kumra, I think. Uh, that was the par three, remember you gave, by resolution you gave city manager the authority to That's sign off on the par three golf course, all the contracts for that. So when, the, when I sent the contracts to the inspector general, I would also send a copy of the resolution. But I guess because it gets so many stuff, they don't read them through, so they, the investigator called me and said, the city manager can't sign that. That's, that's above his authority. And I said, I sent you the resolution. They said, no, you didn't. I said, okay, let me forward the email again. So they forward, e forward the email again. And they said, okay, thank you. So there are, I guess the point is that policies could be changed, but there are people watching what we do, and we still have um, financial best practices and our auditors that would require, uh, that would be checking for the internal controls. And if they're not there, we're going to get a bunch of management comments back that are very bad for a city manager, particularly a new city manager, uh, that would come in and suddenly change a, a well-developed and well-implemented purchasing manual. Um, there's no doubt that OpenGov and the new computer technology that's evolved has made things much more transparent, easier to keep track of, and it's out there for everybody um, to look at. One of the biggest jobs we have is approving the budget. I mean, that's what council has to do every year, and we go through it line item by line item, but we can't always remember what's where and, and how much and why, and one of the advantages of having some of it on the agenda, even if it's on consent agenda, is to bring it back to us so when a resident says, oh, what's gone over there by Lake Catherine, it's like, oh, I know that we're approving the, the funding now for the bleachers or to redo the turf. So when we get questions, it's there. Does anybody going to ask me about the sand filters on the pool? Probably not or, or ever. So I think in, in some cases it's really good to know what's going on. And um, in our discussions in agenda review, you mentioned that there is a contracts matrix that you have that might be able to fill in the blanks if we're not getting them monthly on an agenda if we can still see what's coming up and where that money's being spent so that we do have accountability. Yes, I have a workbook that is updated, an Excel workbook that's, that's updated every day, um, multiple times a day updated. Every time I act on a project, I update it, the comment section. And the workbook is called the Contracts and Agreements Matrix. It has all the awarded contracts. It states when those contracts were awarded, who they're awarded to. Who's the vendor? When is it? What is it about? What we're buying or what is a good or a service? When the contract was, is going to expire, if it has any options to renew, and it has a comment section as to what is the next action. So for example, if I have a contract expiring in July of 2023, I'll have a comment next to that contract saying, start market research in January of 2023 to give myself a lead. It also has another tab called pending projects. That is, the contracts I'm currently working on, all the solicitations I'm currently working on. So you may, you may see like a comment on mowers saying, um, 
waiting on specifications from user department or something like that. But it, it lists everything I'm working on, including the grants, to say whether we have submitted a grant application, or it was awarded, or we're currently drafting the grant application. So that is updated every single day. It's available on the purchasing intranet, but if you want, I can send it to you every single day or every single week or every month. Now, it, in, in your absence, if something were to happen to you, that's normal process for the yeah. next purchasing manager would have to do the same thing. Long, long time ago, you know, Galangs are far away. I used to work with the State Department. And we, we, I started out doing procurement, and here I am again. Um, and we had what we called a pipeline inventory. And the pipeline inventory would show you all the contracts and all the projects you're working on and what the status were of them. So if the ambassador or the deputy chief of mission or your first secretary asks for what's going on with this, I just email the whole report to him and he can go through or her and see the whole thing. So it's the same thing. I can, it's updated every single day. Every time I take an action on something, I go and update it. Every time something new comes up, I add it. Um, Alan, can you go back and address, you mentioned on the 0.5% eight projects that still came before us. If it were dropped to 2.5%, which brings us closer to 500,000. And I understand why the request is, is being made and why we need to uh, approve something substantial with the 65,000 threshold being what it is. In talking to all the other cities, I mean, they range between 20 and, and 500 from what I've been able to see with Boca being at 500 and they are the closest to us in, in size. Right. Um, so they're already there and that's established and th they're finding the need to do the same thing. How many additional would we have had if it went so the other I think, way? I think this is a schedule that you're uh, referring to, Madam Vice Mayor. If we were to drop it to 0.25%, um, <clears throat> two additional contracts would have been brought forward to the council uh, for a total of 21 million or 79% of the expenditures. And there's a little table here, side-by-side -side comparison of the two, the 0.5% and the 0.25%. So if that's what you're looking for, I think that's... It's, it's very close. There's not a whole lot of difference yeah, except the emotional factor that's associated with the number of 500,000 versus a million. It's especially about 500,000. Yeah, from a from 500,000, correct. That, and, and to what my colleague was saying, I mean, that's what the, the public sees and that's what we as elected officials have to be able to, to justify in, in our decision. So um, at this point, I'll, I'm interested to hear what um, the rest of the council has to say on that. But thank you for the information. Questions? Marcy? Okay. Thank you. Madam Mayor, um, I first want to say, Kumara, thank you for the presentation. I've always wanted a horse, maybe not a pink horse, but my dad never let me have one. Um, as stated um, in the first hearing, as you all know, um, I totally agree with increasing um, the bidding threshold from 65,000. I think that's a no-brainer. I also agree that the percentage um, way is the way to go because it flows with the um, budget. However, I strongly feel that changing it from 65 to $1.1 million is just too big of a leap. Um, as I agree 100% with what uh, Mark said, and I see where Rochelle's going, um, we as, in my opinion, elected officials have a fiduciary responsibility with our taxpayers, and it's too high of a cap. No matter how many staff members are involved in the procurement process, which, by the way, is partially done under a cone of silence, we are the legislative body. We here are the legislative body of the city, and we are supposed to provide oversight. And this has absolutely nothing to do with Ron, no matter what text message is said, or staff. I remember before, I, re I actually remember before, um, before Ron was here, and we did have a city manager that was, um, 
overspent the budget. It was horrible. I'm grateful for Ron being here. He made the city what it is. He brought our budget to where it is now. It has absolutely nothing to do with him. Um, and I want to make that clear. Or staff. We have excellent staff. But we don't know who's going to be our next city manager. And um, I hope you're here forever, Kumra. But we don't know, you know, if you're going to be here, you know, in the next month. I hope you are. I really do. And um, I'm very sorry that you're going, Alan. You have very big shoes to fill. Um, and you've been excellent as well. The cost of living has gone up 8%. And um, also inflation, 9.1%. I have no issues by raising this 8 or 9%. I have no problems with that. We have from time to time, as Ron said, given authority to the city manager um, when we felt it was needed for special projects. That can still go on. If there's a, a project that happens and we know it needs to be a rush, we can give him the authority to spend for that particular purpose, just like we've done in the past, the, the um, park, the part the par three. Um, personnel is a reoccurring expense. We approve it budget time. And it doesn't change until the next budget time, um, or it less, or if it comes back to us. Procurement items are totally different. That's like comparing apples to oranges, in my opinion. At the last meeting, during uh, many, and actually during many other meetings, we all uh, have made decisions by comparing ourselves to other municipalities. We can't use that justification only when it works in our favor. Um, I've spoke to so many municipalities, and no one has anywhere near a $1.1 million threshold. In fact, Boca has $500,000 for construction only. The rest is $100,000. So they actually have two different thresholds. Um, and uh, anyway, so the county, which has a multi-billion dollar budget, has a threshold of $200,000. And... Um, I strongly feel that we need checks and balance. I, I like the fact that we see what's going on in our monthly agenda. I love to be in the know of everything, so I get what you're saying, Rochelle. And um, I would be totally in agreement if the amount was lower, um, but I am not uh, I am not for a 1.1 million or 0.5% at all. Great. All right, uh, Carl. Uh, So here we are again getting in the weeds of, well, this is how I feel about it. Um, not only are we accountable to the community and all these bullshit texts we got all day long were fabricated and they didn't come from one person that really wanted to say something because they could have been right there. Other than David, thank you for coming and seeing your, your piece. So I would appreciate it if any council members are involved in getting involved in these random texts or blast phone calls. Please don't do that because I, for one, will separate myself from that council member forever. So um, that, it's, just, it's just divisive and we shouldn't be involved in, in a form, assisting formulation. I didn't say you are, Mark. I'm just saying if, if we're doing it because they come out randomly and I don't appreciate it. We work great together as a team. We get elected to make choices on behalf of the community and I don't think we should have get involved in random clowns around the community throwing out um, uh, phone calls. So having said that, what I also hear is I hear that our staff set, set aside from Boca County or whatever, our staff is asking for our assistance to help them run more efficient. So, and I will, and I'll give you some examples. Tonight on the agenda, on the consent agenda, was fleet emergency vehicle. So I don't know how fast that could have been purchased if this wasn't on, but a fleet emergency vehicle for fire, we all support that. Just if these weren't on the agenda, how much faster would they be purchased? The problem we have with a lot of those purchases, particular vehicles, and because of the supply chain disruptions, is a lot of those vendors, I, I have to go to the city attorney and says we have to do a letter of intent. Because when we tell them it's gonna to come to council in another month, 
They said, well, if, it, if, it, if you wait another month, you won't get in the order bank. And something that takes 12 months, it's going to take 18 months. It's going to take two years, that kind of problem we have. So I have to go to the city attorney, and we have to do a lot of intent saying, hey, we're, we're planning to do this. You're literally committing the city to this. But if you say no, then we are at legal jeopardy. Right, Max? That's correct. So my point is, is that um, nothing on the consent agenda would have been in front of us tonight. The one thing that would have been in front of us was the Landscape and Irrigation Service Contractors Program. That's a $10 million issue, and not one council member pulled it to discuss it. So why the two messages? We have granted the city manager and staff whatever the bond was, $30 million to approve um, everything around the city, basically, instead of just calling it out. And, um, you know, we did that. So I'm not understanding, you know, like, again, you know, last council meeting, the words were brought up, you know, we're Palm Beach Gardens. We're plowing the fields. We're people, people are looking at us first initially. Well, now all of a sudden on this one particular agenda, we're looking at everybody else. What do we care what the county does? We could care less what Boca does. It's not relevant to what we're doing. So I see it. It doesn't change the budget one dollar and the efficiency. You guys have exhausted us on how transparent it is. Um, you know, transparency and accountability. You know, that word needs to equal efficiency. So you've, you've explained to us how. I'm going to support it as written because, like I said in the last first reading, and I, I'm not, I didn't call anybody out, but I was just saying again, we don't know on the, on the consent agenda half the time what's even on it. So how much are our electric bills? How much are our fuel bills? How much are our, you know, our other monthly bills that are adding up to how many millions a year that aren't even under the council's umbrella because they're already paid for? But I'm sure it goes beyond 0.5%, right? So I don't, I'm, not, I'm going to support it, and I hope my other council members can see this is just nothing's changing. It just makes it more efficient, and it makes the, the, the process... It, I mean, whether it's on the agenda or not, the transparency and accountability doesn't change. So it's like the process really doesn't change at all. So I'm not understanding why we want to reduce it or, or vote no against it. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm for it because it just makes sense. And it's going to cut down in staff time. I don't know how much, but it, it will. Um, and it'll cut down on, on council time and looking at, you know, what might be on there, what might not be on there. So, like, again, we approved a $10 million item on consent. So that's how I feel about it. Whether I, whether we all have support or not, I don't know. All right. I believe Mark wants to make a point of order. I, I just think if, if you had come to us with a 0.2%, it would have been a no-brainer. We would have said fine. I think just the magnitude of the number and the, the concern amongst the constituents and, uh, and the, the outlier that we've become raises a big red flag, and I think that's the concern that a lot of people have. All right. Um, any other point of order before I continue? Rochelle, did you want to no. speak second again? All right. Um, as you can tell, we've all had a lot of consideration regarding this uh, ordinance. And because we care how this affects our residents, and one of the ways our residents communicates with us is with, with their tax base. And so we think about what we can do to save our residents money all the time. And as Ron said, time is money. Uh, some of the conver I just want to touch base on a couple of the conversations. I will tell you, most of us do read our consent agenda thoroughly. Um, oh, I, I wasn't I, saying anything. <laughs> I was just saying I do it's as well. there. Thank we you, don't Chelsea. even yeah, pull it. In that's general, all. Like, you know, I know we all look at it. We do. So, like the mobile repair, um, which was purchase award E, was I was so excited to talk about that during my agenda review. But that's why we have agenda reviews, because I was like, this is immensely cool. We have a vehicle that can show up at a fire and fix a truck while it's at the fire, and it can change lives, can save lives and change how things happen in, in our city. So consent agenda matters. We all do take our time. 
um, regarding um, the text messages. There were, te there were text messages sent from an anonymous number to residents in Palm Beach Gardens attempting to prompt upset. Um, however, nobody got upset. Mostly everyone was upset that someone got a hold of their cell phone numbers. The information that was being shared made absolutely no sense whatsoever. And also, as far as transparency, if you go onto our website, most of us here have friends that are elected officials. Um, one of them said to me the other day, well, I just want to look something up about my budget. And they had a huge packet of paper that they had printed out. And I said, well, let me just show you mine. And it was right here. It was available. Um, not only that, but all of our council members are constantly in the community or on social media or sending emails. Um, I have an email I send out that 3,000 people a week open. And they're all residents. I track all of the outcomes. On, so we are available. We are beyond transparent. Our budget's transparent. Our website's transparent. Every project is out there, even projects that have been submitted. And now you can even um, do your survey, your information online for everything. It's all, it's all right there. So a lot of this transparency talk needs to stop. And whomever is bothering our residents by getting their cell phone numbers, I highly recommend them to decease because they, uh, they look awful as they do it. Uh, as far as resident outreach, I had five emails. Four of them came from pretty much the same street. So I don't know if that was sitting on the corner talking to, and it was actually a street that our, one of our council members live on. So I can't consider that uh, an accurate reflection of our resident's concern because, you know, uh, that's not great. And then I had another one that was an email from a, a, re a resident who's a frequent colleague of a, uh, of a council member. So when I see that, that makes me think that that's not valid, that that's, you know, I don't want to call it pillow talk, but dog walking talk that isn't based on data. But what I will say is that I'm, I've never done this. So I, I'm going to love Robert's rules. I'm going to pass my gavel here to my vice mayor because what I'd like to do, and I'm going to have Max help me, is to do an addendum to this. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to amend Ordinance 13 2022 to a 0.25% of our budget with the caveat that the matrix that Rochelle and Kumra were discussing is provided to council on a basis that we can decide together to be consistent and transparent as well as published to the website. So I'm looking for a motion and I'd love Max to clarify. Okay, just for clarification, um, you want to make a change to the ordinance and all, you're amending the motion to approve the ordinance. You're making a basically an alternative motion to approve the ordinance at 0.25. And then as part of the motion, you're, you want to vote to at, direct the city manager to provide you that uh, contract matrix monthly. Yes, please. Yes, ma'am. I'm that's, looking for a okay, motion. Okay, I think that's, that is the motion that is on the floor. Thank you. You're making, you're making the motion because you gave it to I me. I gave you my gavel. So, so I'm making the motion. motion. I'm, that's right. I'm, I can now make a motion because I don't have the gavel. So I'm making a motion. I'm looking for a second I'm giving for you discussion. The We're not oh, passing it. This allows for discussion. And, and if you, even as the vice mayor, you can second a motion or you, you anybody can second the motion. I yeah. will second Chelsea's motion. Okay, just so everybody understands where, where we're at. Um, we, have an, we have an alternative motion on the floor that has been made and seconded, and it is on the floor. That motion is on the floor for discussion and will be voted on first. If it prevails, then the, the initial motion will die. Okay. So we're back to discussion. So we're, we're going to, to discuss, discuss that. Yes, yes, we are. Michelle, you go. We're back to discussion now on the 0.25%. So I, I think it's a, a healthy compromise. The the, the I know we don't compare ourselves in what we do, but there is a, a financial precedent in the county for an amount close to, to where this would put us. And we know that our systems ultimately behind that amount are probably better than the ones that support the other one. Um, having the matrix and being able to see monthly uh, or asking for it more frequently if we feel that we need it will give us the tools to be able to see exactly what we're coming. And that puts the onus on us where it should be, that we have to look to see what is coming up and where that money is spending. We've already approved it. It's in the budget. We've already approved it. It's just bringing back, oh, this is the time now for this to, to happen. So I'm comfortable with that combination, and I think it's a, a, a good compromise 
for us and, and a much easier pill to swallow emotionally to, to go to that amount than the other amount. Can someone please explain to me the matrix? I missed that part of it. You're saying that the report that you're talking about, the binder? Yeah. The matrix is a Excel workbook. It's an Excel workbook with three tabs. <clears throat> the first tab is for awarded contracts. It states, it's lists in columns and, and rows, uh, when the contract was awarded, to whom it was awarded, when it expires, if there's an option to renew, uh, how much was, was the contract for, and what goods or services it was. And it has a comment beside each contract that's currently awarded to say like, uh, review for OTR in June 2023, or allowed to expire, department doesn't want to use this anymore, or something like that, right? The second tab in the Excel workbook is for pending projects. That's any project I'm currently working on where I'm drafting the solicitation. So it may not actually become a solicitation for three, four months, but it's there and it's listed and it shows. And this goes back to, the whole workbook goes back to 2012. So you can scroll through all the way back up to the top and see stuff that has been grayed out, that has been completed. The third tab is, is for grants that I actively involve in applying for. In this case, the status of the grant, whether we got the grant, if the grant is under, is being, being reviewed, if the grant is being drafted, etc. And that workbook is updated multiple times a day because every day I work on all these projects. So every time I update something, it's updated and it's posted on the intranet, the internal internet, so it's posted on that. So I can make that available to you on a daily basis, a monthly basis through the city manager, or whatever you want. And that's what you're requesting? Is that part of your motion? Like, I didn't understand the yeah, motion, so if that you, part of the I'm motion. I'm sorry, may I speak? Okay, so if you go on to the city's website right. and you click on projects, yes. you can see um, projects that have been applied for, projects that have been approved. Correct. Um, so you see all of it in real time. So most of the time if I'm with a resident and they say, oh, what's that building? I'll say, well, here you go. This is the link and you can look it up. This is the exact same thing but for procurement. And it's live. They, it's just like on our, our, our budget is now updated every night. It is completely transparent, and it's a list of everything that has but come part in. part of the motion, you had said you wanted to work with staff to... Yeah, and I'd like that to be provided to city council uh -huh. that's um, what on, I a, on a that's basis what I that, that we part. should all decide. Okay, if you guys want it every day, cause Kumara, uh, uh, or if you want it once a week in an email on whatever, or if we are having city council every month, and if you want to send it out two weeks before every council so we have two weeks to, di you know, to check it beforehand, that's why I want council to discuss it. This is something that you guys are... are what I heard was people asking for um, the opportunity to review what's coming in, to get excited about the, the repair truck that can help us, uh, or to understand it for so our at residents. A, at a separate meeting, then, we would have a car, or staff would come back with a, an option. Is can that I, what the motion you know, was? To be clear, what the motion did was the motion, other than changing it from 0.5 to 0.25, was directing the city manager to make sure that the council members received the contract makers on a monthly basis. So you give me that direction, I will make something work to accommodate your needs. Okay. And okay. We'll, we'll, two weeks before the meeting, do we want to be specific about that? Well, if, if you're talking about contracts that are being approved or that have been approved within the month, right now we're getting them a week in advance. I think the idea that I brought up last month was um, whatever contracts are coming up for or whatever contracts are being approved in that month, we'd like to know what they are. So at least you know what they are on a monthly basis. So that's a month in advance, a month previous. Yeah, I don't need to know what happens 10 years ago. I don't, I don't care if about The that. contract matrix will provide that to you. What it does, as Kumar said, it provides a list of uh, contracts that we've executed, and it also provides a list of upcoming contracts that we have in the queue that are in the process, that are going through the current process that Kumar went through in such great detail. What we have to determine is how often, how, when in advance of the meeting do we want that information? A week, just like we get our agendas. Why don't you let me deal with that and get back to you on how that's going to work, whether you can have direct access, whether we email it to you. I need to work with staff on that to make sure we can meet your needs. 
then why don't we postpone that vote until we find out exactly how you want to work it? I don't think you really need to postpone I know exactly what you want. I just got to make sure I can make it happen. If I have my way, you'll have direct access. Can I make direct access to that? I got to find out. There, is there sensitive it's, information in that matrix I can't go out to the public? No. No. No, it's all public no. record. No, it's all public record. The, 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 the information is actually available right now on the intranet. If you go there you to go. the intranet, to the purchasing department's intranet that you have access to, you can download the contracts matrix. It opens up as a workbook. An we'll just workbook. provide the instructions on how to access the information and they can have it anytime they want if we can give them access to the intranet yeah. or put it somewhere else. Yeah, I'll work with where Eric and we can it. do that. And you can see it on a daily basis if you'd like. No, but I still think you want to see, the public wants to know, well, you would think that the public would want to know what contracts are being approved on a monthly basis so that everybody knows what's coming or what happened in that month. That's already on it. I know that's in there, but I don't want to have to search for it. Like you should just no, provide it. No, it's on it, one, know, one page. page. Right. Okay, so that should be emailed to council with the agenda link. You just pick uh, the tab you want. Right. To say these are the right. contracts that are, that are coming through this month, and these are what they are. So at least that way you know. And just like now, you get, we get a monthly update where we get you know, on, on their consent agenda what the purchase orders are on a monthly basis. Can't you just look at the first page of it? Well, why, I, well you could, but why can't you just send it to us? Maybe. Just like we get it sent to us now in our if consent agenda. Could. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's not a problem. It sounds to me like everybody's kind of in, in line with each other now. Well, I think so. one, of the, one of the thoughts, one of the, one of the concerns that people had too was that you didn't know what was, if there was no, if there was, if there was no, linked to what was being purchased because everything was under that le limit, then people didn't know what was being purchased. I know it's on the internet. You can find it. But having a list, these were the things that were purchased this month, is something that I think should still be a part of the, 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 the conversation, or at least part of the agenda, whether you vote on it or not because it no longer falls in that level. So these are the five things that were purchased this month. Okay. So we've gone, we've gone from an emotional 1.1 million to agreeing on the, the matrix being provided to us on a monthly basis. Can we move on from this and vote? Well, I'd like to know, know what more, I, exactly I'm voting on. The, the vote, is, the motion that is on the floor is to amend the ordinance from 0.25, from 0.5 to 0.25, and there is direction. It's not part of the ordinance, but is direction to the city manager to provide the contract matrix to the council on a monthly basis. That's the motion that was made and seconded. Would it be better to remove and manage the part about directing the, the city manager to just have the clean ordinance with nothing but the percentage on it? That is, that is certainly up to you, Madam Mayor. You made the motion. All right. How would we how would we work if, on the if you wish part? to amend your motion so that so that you remove the direction about the contract matrix and only have it to the be the point two five, you can do that. And if the second the the if uh, Vice Mayor Litt agrees with you, then that motion still is on the floor as the alternative motion. All right, excellent. So I would like to amend my motion to Ordinance thirteen twenty twenty two to um, change the consideration to point two five percent of the budget for purchasing authority. And the rest we can leave for later. And, and uh, Vice Mayor, do you, lit, are you still willing to second that motion? I will second that motion. Okay. That is the motion that is on the floor. So you don't want to have any requirement for the staff to show you what contracts have come up in no, the no. We're going I, I want to, to do that separately. That separately. I can address that. We have the ability to give you direct access to his report. You can see it every day. And it has pending contracts, it has completed contracts, it it's, has the yes. whole... But in terms of knowing what was done at that month, from month pre previous council member to this council, there's a month that runs through and there are purchases that are being made. You don't want to know exactly what was purchased. I know you can go on the internet and look at it, but don't you want to have a list of what those contracts were? I think we. I think that's something we can request to the city manager. For example, every week we get a zoning a report from planning and zoning right. that has a list of every project, just like we have that reflects what is on our website. 
and um, staff does a really great job getting that out, and it sounds like we have the support of staff to provide that transparency, right. and, and we'll, we'll do it publicly. We can review it publicly, and if there are things we don't understand or if we feel like we're not seeing everything, we can change it again. We have the ability to ask the city manager, that's our job, to direct the city manager to provide us that information. So I think I'm in agreement with you, but we still can leave it off of the second amended motion. That's it. I don't think it needs fine. to be on the ordinance. It's not. It doesn't fine. have to be on the ordinance for it to happen. I agree with that. But the percentage of the um, acquisition approval should definitely be an ordinance, and we need to vote on that. All right. So we now have a new motion and a new second. Can we call the question? So I will have oh, to call the question because Chelsea made the motion. Well, no, but if you're calling it, let's call it. I call the question. <laughs> all in favor? All, all in favor? Aye. 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 And all opposed? I'm going to abstain from the vote. I don't, I don't like you, it. You can't abstain under state law. You have to vote yay or nay. All right. Um, I'm a no. Nay. Uh, I'm going to vote no. I'm sorry. But I don't feel comfortable with it. I feel comfortable with it, but I just don't. There was too much going on here that but. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change the, the final answer, but um, thank you. Motion passes three to two. Thank you. Moving on to resolution 72, if the clerk could please read the title. Can we ask Ron now? Resolution 72, 2022, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving the appointment of a regular member to the City of Palm Beach Gardens Police Officers Pension Board, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you. Alan, do we have a presentation for uh, resolution 72? Um, no, Madam Mayor, there's no presentation. Uh, there's, we have one vacancy on the police pension board. There are three applications for council's review and consideration. All right, so we don't have any comment cards. Could I get a motion and a second to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you. Madam, I think we council to needs to, to select it first. My fault. Oh, sorry. Oh, we need to a little flustered. Uh, All right. So, um, if I could go ahead and begin the conversation. So, Sean O'Brien is one of the applicants, I believe. Just to be clear, who seconded yeah. the motion? I seconded who made it? Chelsea. Yeah, but it wasn't. No, no, no. I, no. Uh, no resolution seventy-two, ma'am. We did. We didn't. We stopped ourselves. We have to discuss the, the candidates. Okay. Thank you. My mistake. All right, so um, let's open it up to discussion. Marcy, why don't you go first? There's no discussion. I, it was an echo, so I didn't hear what you were. Um, somebody made a motion, and then somebody said we didn't. We don't. We have, I've been told we should discuss it first, that we have three applicants. Oh, yes. So we need to discuss the three applicants. So I'm happy with staff's recommendation. Okay. Anyone else? I'm happy with staff's recommendation. All right, so staff's recommendation is Mr. Sean O'Brien. So um, anyone else have anything to say? No, all right, can I get a motion and a second? Now I'll make a motion to approve resolution 72-2022 uh, for Sean O'Brien. Thank you. I'll second. All right, so hearing uh, no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Sean, for helping with that. All right, moving. Moving along, next item is council actions, discussions, uh, items of interest. Uh, had a conversation a while ago with um, council member uh, Marciano that a bunch of us do sit on different committees as we represent the city of Palm Beach Gardens. So I wanted to give everyone the opportunity to sort of catch us up on that as necessary. Does anyone want to talk about what they've been up to for a moment for the, the boards or committees that are specific to um, the city? No? All right, well, well I'll, I'll yeah, start. Well, my, question, my question really was to you, Chelsea. Yeah. I know you said on the TPA, I know there's a ton of stuff going on with, with transportation in the county, and mm -hmm. we're so grateful that you are on the, on the TPA board and, and know what's happening. And um, so if you, if you have anything to report, I mean, this was something that we used to do a long time ago, the council members, but the problem with that was, you know, Maria would come with like eight pages of places <laughs> that she'd been, and you're like, geez, Maria, you, I know you've been to a thousand different places, and, um, and which is great, but um, sometimes having uh, anything specific that really relates to the city, and 
I know there's been a lot of activity at the TPA, so if there's anything you think is important to the city, I think that would be good for transparency purposes so the residents know that we're working. No, I appreciate that. Okay, great. So regarding the TPA, we are, um, I have to be careful because we have a vote tomorrow morning. So anything I say, uh, I need to just keep, uh, keep sunshine in mind in case any of the other 20 board members happen to be just glued to their computer tonight watching us, which I, I really doubt. <laughs> but nonetheless, sunshine, sunshine. So tomorrow we're going to discuss the draft tentative work program. It's a little bit spicy right now because some of the outer year funding is um, from, uh, that is funded by federal and state dollars is uh, being held back from FDOT because projects are costing so much now. So the TPA, as a Board of Governors, prioritizes the road, the roadways within the county, and then FDOT then lines them up, and as they come up through, they, the funding is set aside, and then the project is taken over. For example, we have uh, th three projects that were already approved, and they will be happening in the next five years, and they are funded, and we can talk about that a little bit. We do have one project that is on the list to, um, it has been accepted as a grant for the local initiatives grant, but it is not yet funded by, um, by FDOT on the outer year. So because of other roadways and some are state roads, some are local roads, there are all kinds of different roads, but um, FDOT is earmarking the funding for that. And as we heard, supply chain is a real thing. So some of those roadways have been on the list since 2004 and haven't been built yet. So you can imagine how much more a road costs now than it did in 2004. As far as what's happening in the city itself, um, we have a bunch of projects coming up. Burns Road, Kyoto, Fairchild, and Holly Drive are all funded and will all be happening in the next five years for the mobility improvements that we are getting grants for from the TPA. And um, we vote tomorrow on the chair because we've had a lot of elections in the county and we have 21 on the Board of Governors, everyone from a port commissioner to large city representatives to uh, county commissioners. And so our board membership will be changing tomorrow with a few new people from county commission. Uh, we lost our chair uh, when he did not uh, get reelected. So I'm currently chair and we'll be voting on chair and vice chair tomorrow morning, bright and early. <laughs> and so that's it for the TPA. And I can also talk a little bit about career source. Um, they're dealing with Florida's REACH Act, which is HB 1507. Uh, where they're trying to um, understand expansion or absorbing different career sources. And so uh, they brought us in at the end of October to discuss what that would look like. So I don't know much more than that because it was kind of just a, a finding mission for them. And then the other thing I sit on is Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council that I'll meet on Friday. And then I think we're all part of the, um, the chamber um, business boards. So if anyone has anything else. Yeah, and League of Cities. You want to do League of Cities? So as the representative for League of Cities, I will congratulate the city of Wellington. They beat us out again on Read for the Record, but we're coming for you next year. We have a plan, so watch out. Um, and at this point, uh, Chelsea and I are both scheduled to go up to Tallahassee for Palm Beach County Days the first week in March, uh, the, the start of session. And we'll have more information going forward when the priorities are set and when we've had a chance to meet with, with Matt, with the city's lobbyist, and, uh, and Ron, and, and see what we're going up to advocate for. So, um, that's right. it. Anybody else, Marcy? I want to comment on one of the things that you said, um, which is very true. I brought that up at our agenda review, and that is DOT is... Um, taking certain projects off or pushing them uh, farther in, uh, in advance uh, because of funding, because the fact that projects are costing so much. So they, instead of doing five, they're doing three. And this is one thing that we need to be very careful of. And I'm very appreciative of the fact that you're paying close attention in on TPA because, um, and doing such a wonderful job because we do have projects here in our city and you know DOT is has a lot to do with the infrastructure that will help FPL and all of the employees that are soon going to be here um, with several projects so it's up to us to make sure we keep an eye on it and and Chelsea's doing that and I know our staff is doing that very carefully so um, but it's important to know that just because they say it could be coming up next year it could be coming up and you know, two to three years. So we have to be very careful of that. 
Yeah, thank you for that. And the good news is that the, the projects that are happening in the next five years still look like, I don't want to say anything because like, they say they are currently funded. So the, the issue right now is the outer years, that 27 to 28. But I think it's something that we all have to watch. And as far as our projects that were accepted by the TPA for those grants for that outer year, we are number two out of five. So if, if, awesome. if the money does start to trickle, we hopefully will be right behind a project that BOCA was approved for. Am I, am I right, Natalie? Am I getting it right? <laughs> okay. And, and one other thing I want to say is um, Rochelle and I put together a um, schedule for lighting the Hanukkah menorah, um, which is located at the community center, Burns Road Community Center. Um, and thanks to David Levy, the menorah is now lit. Let, it's another miracle of lights happened the other morning because the menorah had no lights. It was broken. David came with his tools and Bert, and they were able to fix the menorah, and now we have light again. So with that said, I want to invite everybody um, Monday night and every Sunday, Monday, every Hanukkah night thereafter um, at 530 at the menorah. We'll do a, a, a lighting, and we would love to have everyone uh, join us. And one of our green market vendors will be doing a menorah lighting Sunday morning at the green market at 11. The pickle vendor, uh, Rabbi and Hani, so um, they'll be doing that for the community in the in the morning on Sunday as well. Madam Mayor, two random uh, items of good and welfare. One, uh, I was just having breakfast about a couple weeks ago, and Chief Ippolito was there with a colleague, and a little girl was running around the restaurant. She was super cute, and he walked out and got one of those nice little plastic uh, fire fire hats and just lit up the whole restaurant and everybody was so so proud of that and i was i couldn't have been more proud to to see one of our firefighters just do something like that for no other reason than to be nice and um secondly i went and picked up the christmas tree the other day and i saw the city of palm beach gardens had a nice flyer about safety of, of christmas trees and sitting in my car so I should probably read it before uh, the tree burns down. <laughs> but uh, just, just a nice touch from the city and the community. And I, I just wanted to say I, I wanted to thank them for that. And it was just nice, nice items. That was great. Carl, do you have anything you want to share? I want to know how what Bert did exactly to fix that menorah. Because I'm doubting. Did you bring your bank pen over there? And it was David. Move a cord. It was Bert's know, muscle Bert's, and Bert's David's wiring. Didn't you go, oh, well, we know Bert. David could do it. Yeah. Bert, yeah, thank, good job. Did you bring a lollipop or something? He was or? the muscle behind it. Oh. But I passed the main switch. Ah, uh, oh, and I'm glad Mark's electric car didn't blow up while he was <laughs> driving around a Christmas tree. Stop it. All right, I, I just want to say two, two or three quick things. I want to thank our recreation staff. Our, our Tis the Gardens has been extraordinary. We love the tree lighting. It, it gets better every year. The senior luncheon today, Marcy and I had a wonderful time. Mark came. We, we really enjoyed being there. The list is really long, so thank you guys for all you do, not to mention the uh, Pickleball, Pickleball and Tennis Center also having the World Pickleball Open and Little Mo's back-to-back. Um, that's, you know, 1,200 people coming in and out in a period of two weeks, not to mention all the staffing. So that was pretty amazing to watch. And I also want to do a special thank you to our uh, police and fire chiefs for coming with me. The Oaks East neighborhood asked us to come and talk to them. And I thought they'd be so excited to talk about projects and the things that we talk about. No, let me just tell you, our two chiefs were the stars. I couldn't, they wouldn't stop. They, were, they, wanted, they could have talked to them for four or five hours. You guys did a phenomenal job. You do an amazing job representing us. You brought things that mattered to them. You talked about their needs. And uh, I couldn't have been more proud. I think my cheeks hurt at the end of the night just watching you guys from smiling. So that was great. And then um, lastly, I'm sure you guys have noticed or heard that we have a new butterfly garden that will be coming up soon. So it's what I've been told by staff is that it's, uh, they're working on it. So hopefully in the next couple months, we will be able to have a proper opening. But there, it is located at, um, at the Oaks Park just by Oaks East. So that's, that's all I wanted to share about all that. So, but Mark, thank you. That was fun to talk about. Yeah, bees are next. All right, next is the city, uh, city attorney report. Max, do you have a report? Um, Merry Christmas and happy Hanukkah, and I hope you all have a lovely new year. All right, I like that. And then uh, thank you, Alan, so much for all your years of service. Thank you, Alan. We're so appreciative. And uh, Bert and Dana, congratulations on not being opposed. And, and, and me. And, and me, yeah. And uh, if there's no other business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.